Hello, hello, good, good evening, hello. It's nice to see everyone, good evening. I'm glad to see everybody here. And how are you guys doing tonight? I personally am doing pretty good. I had a very long day. I was very, very tired all day, but I was very happy to get some laundry done, so I was very proud of myself for that. Um, but today was mostly a very lazy day just because where I am, it's raining a lot. It was raining all day. So it caused everything to, you know, feel a little bit, like, quieter, a little more cozy. So I found myself, like, taking, like, little mini naps throughout the day. <laughs> but luckily we're here. And honestly, that's... I'm really looking forward to this stream, especially just because um, I'm definitely in the reading sort of mood because of just... Because just 
how cozy it is outside. It's just really nice. I love rainy weather. All right, so with all that being said, I'm going to bring us over to our reading room, and then we can get started with tonight's stream. Let me... Okay, so from where we left off in the story, so what has been happening? Oh, wait. I'm frozen for a moment. There we go. Okay, so what's been happening within the story? So our character, Koichi, has witnessed a very tragic accident involving Yukari Sakuragi. Now, there is little references and little hints towards a curse within in Yomiyama North Middle. However, unfortunately, we don't really know much about the story behind that yet. But I'm sure with this interlude and with the preceding chapters, we should be able to figure out some stuff. We may be able to unravel this mystery, get some clues to this essentially Final Destination-esque situation. <laughs> so, okay, let me get my ambiance going. Some rain in the background. And feel free to let me know if the ambiance is louder than my voice or if, you know, you want me to speak a little quieter, you want me to speak a little louder. Up to you. Feel free to sit back, relax, enjoy a cool drink, a warm drink, read, write, draw, do whatever you wish, and we can just move along to our next bit of Another by Yukidoya. Thank you. Let me see. Oh, wow. I am very low on this screen. Hold on. Let me just scooch myself up. There we go. Hi. Hello. You can see my face now. You can see my adorable little face now. <laughs> okay. So, with that being said, let's get back into it. Let's see. There we go. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> Interlude 1. Someone in third year, class 3, died. Yeah, it was a huge deal. They said she slipped on the stairs in Building C and she landed badly. No, that's not what happened. It's not? Then what was it? I heard that when she fell down the stairs, she threw her umbrella uh, on... She threw her umbrella in front of her, and the tip of it went through her throat. It went through her throat. Ugh. I heard another story that said she got stabbed through the eye, though, not the throat. Oh my God! Really? Either way, it was such a gruesome scene that they put a gag order on the witness or something. She was the class representative for the girls, right? The girl who died. And that's what I heard. I heard that her mom died the exact same day, in a car accident. Yeah, I heard that too. Hey, do you think this is because of that curse? That curse? You mean you know about that? Just what I overheard. I don't know the whole story. They do call it the curse of third year class three. See? But it's dangerous to just go blabbing about it. But secretly, everyone knows the story, right? How a popular kid from the class that in class named Misaki died 26 years ago? Y yeah. And how this year is one of those years? Could be. That's awful. What if I get put into class 3 next year? No use worrying about it now, is there? But why not transfer out while you're still in the second year? Hmm. I mean, it's not like it happens every year. I think last year was an off year. What about the year before that? That year it happened. The curse is capricious. Once it starts, something bad happens to the class every month, right? Yeah. Someone dies. Yeah. Every month, at least one person with ties to the class. Not just the students? Their families are in danger, too. Especially the immediate family. I heard more distant relatives are fine. Wow. You sure know a lot about it. There's an upperclassman in my, ten in my kendo club named Meijima. He's in class 3. He's been telling me about it on the sly lately. He acts like he doesn't really believe in it, so that's probably why he told an outsider like me about it. Okay, so he doesn't believe it. But, I mean, 
someone really did die. Purely coincidence. Purely an unlucky accident. Curses are, are baloney. That's what he says. Maybe he's right. I have no idea. But really, I think the best thing you can do is just stay away from that class. Yeah? How awful would that be? If we got sucked into that? God forbid, I mean. Just talking to you. Just talking to you about this stuff could be super dangerous. What do we do? What if- Hey, cut it out. Yeah. Let's just drop it. Chapter 6 June 1st You probably don't have to worry much at this point. Oh. I'm so sorry. I have my notifications on. I usually turn them off for these streams. There we go. Also, I made a mistake in reading one bit, so let me backtrack a little bit. Chapter 6, June 1. There we go. You probably don't have to worry much at this point. The aging lead physician gave his diagnosis in his usual breezy tone. From what I saw today, your condition is stabilized. You aren't feeling any pain anymore, are you? No. Then there's no problem with you going to school as normal. Even his crisp delivery of this news couldn't wipe away my anxiety completely. Still feeling fundamentally depressed, I took several deep breaths in front of the physician. Yeah, definitely no more ominous sensations in there. A slight difficulty breathing from the pain in my chest a week earlier. The symptom had begun presenting again from time to time, but even that had vanished in the last two or three days. So, then my gym class? Strenuous exercise is still out of the question. Let's see how things are in a month. It may take longer. Okay. Just to be sure, I want you to come in again this weekend. If there don't seem to be any changes, we'll meet again in a month. I nodded, then lifted my eyes to the calendar that hung on the wall, on the exam room. Yesterday had been the first day of June. This weekend... That would be Saturday the 6th. When I witnessed Yukari Sakuragi's horrific accident on the second day of midterms, that had been exactly a week ago, a pain in my chest had arisen from the problem in my lungs. Just as the anxiety had flashed through my mind, and it warned me it was. I got into the municipal hospital the next day I have it looked at, and received the unhappy diagnosis of signs of a minor pneumophoratic event. However, they had also told me it hasn't reached the stage of second reoccurrence. Hi there, Miss Maria Delusion. Welcome in. No worries. Don't worry about being late. Everyone's welcome at any time. No worries. Let's see. Although there is a very tiny hole and a minor collapse, it appears that the surrounding tissue is healed. Thanks to that, you managed to stay in decent shape and avoid a deflation of a lung, the physician had explained. You probably won't need any special treatment. Just get some rest at home. And so, per the physician's orders, since I had been shut up at my house all week, I hadn't been to school. So, I had almost no idea what was happening in the class after the accident. The barest of information that I had gotten was that Sakuragi's mother, who had been in a car accident, had died the same day. That the funeral... That the funeral for mother and daughter had been conducted quietly for close relatives only. That, of course, everyone in class couldn't hide the intense shock they felt. That was about it. I didn't know what Mamie Saki had been doing since then. I wasn't utterly without means to find out, of course, but I didn't want to use those means on her or on the others. For some reason, I felt an overriding hesitation that I had lost my nerve. There we go. Okay. I still didn't have a class list, so the only student I could call directly and feel out was Teshigawara, whose cell phone number I had. And him, I tried to call a couple times during the previous week, but he never once answered. Maybe he knew it was me calling, and he wasn't picking up on purpose. My grandmother had heard about the accident, but all she had uh, done was a flu effusively repeat, how frightening, or I feel 
Mrs. Zobath, um, it seemed her concern lie completely with the health of her grandson. Whether or not my grandfather understood what was going on, he bobbled his head to every word my grandmother said. Reiko was incredibly concerned about my mental state, but she still wouldn't in, when get into the subjects we touched on. I couldn't bring it up. Up either. Mario Ray shrieked as energetically as ever. There wasn't so much as a peep from my dad in India, and I hadn't told him of the news yet either. In the midst of it all, there was, in fact, one person I could talk to relatively casually. Fun funnily enough, that was Miss Mizuno from the Municipal Hospital. It was two days after Sakuragi's, get Sakuragi's death that she had called me, the day after I'd gone to the hospital in the afternoon. Are you all right? How are your lungs? She cut straight to the point. After all, you did see a terrible accident up close. That's going to have an effect on you physically. You know about that? I heard from my little brother, you know. My youngest brother, who's in the same class as he was North Middle. Takedo Mizuno. He's on the basketball team. So that really was him. You came to the hospital instead of going to school yesterday, right? Yeah. Nothing bad at enough to hospitalize you, I guess. Thankfully, no. I managed to pull myself through it, they said. When are you coming back? To the hospital, I mean. Next week, Tuesday morning. Okay, you want to get together after that? Huh? Why, before I could say any more, Miss Mizuno went on. Something's been bothering me. All kinds of things. I don't know what's connected to what or how, and what's not connected at all. Plus, there's still a thing we need to talk about. That thing? About why I've been asking her all those questions about the, the girl who died in a hospital at the end of April? So now... What is that word? Hold on. That's a new word. Haven't heard that one before. Huh. Okay. I apologize. I'm going to butcher this next word. So now you're conval convalescing at home. Okay, there we go. I'm trying. Don't start brooding. If you do have to be hospitalized again, I'll put everything I've got into taking care of you. Uh, okay. Thank you. That's what I told her, but I wanted to avoid what was happening at any cost. I want to avoid that happening at any cost. Well, I'll see you at the hospital on Tuesday then. I'll call you before that, though. Miss Mizuno was being very considerate of my frame of mind because she didn't once start talking about our common interest. She hadn't even once called me horror boy like she always did. And deep down, I was relieved. I just witnessed real life blood and gore two days earlier, and unsurprisingly, my emotions had suffered for it. The nauseating red that spread across the umbrella that day. The way Yukari Sakuragi had looked with the metal pike stabbed through her throat. The profuse amounts of flesh of fresh blood that had pumped out of her. It was all burned into my eyes and wouldn't go away. The sound of the umbrella snapping and her body rolling to its side. Mr. Miyamoto's voice shouting, the siren on the ambulance, the screams and soft weeping from the students. All of it still lingered in my ears. Raw. As much as I tried to tell myself they were two separate things, I was taking a break from horror novels and horror movies for a little while. Just then, in my state of mind, just then, in my state of mind, I genuinely couldn't take it. Rain was falling again, just like the week before. Apparently, the rainy season had truly begun, much earlier than most years. As usual, my grandmother had offered to take me to the hospital in the car, but I firmly refused and came to the hospital alone. I promised to miss, uh, meet Miss Mizuno as soon as my checkup was over. She said she had to work the night shift, and she'd go straight from that to the hospital dorm to nap. We'd arranged that I'd call her once I was done. Standing near the front entrance to the outpatient area, I called Miss Mizuno's cell phone, then spent the waiting time, waiting time gazing at the rain-soaked scenery outside. It was then that I thought about how the rain in Yomiyama was clammier than Tokyo. Considering the pollutants in the air, 
The opposite was probably true, so it was just an issue of my perceptions. Maybe the word clammy wasn't exactly right. Maybe I should say something more neutral, like it had a richer quality. The walkways to the building, the ebb and flow of people, the plants on the foreground and the mountains in the distance, the rain drenching all of these things seemed to take an intrinsically intrinsically different shades and elements for each. I certainly don't mean that it was dirty. My eyes came to rest on the puddles I collected on the ground. These were of the same. How could I put it? They seemed to have more colors and deeper colors than the puddles in Tokyo. Perhaps the problem wasn't the rain itself, but the difference in the objects seen through it. Or maybe it really was nothing more than a mirror for the images of my mind. Sorry to keep you waiting. I heard a voice beside me. It was the first time I had seen Miss Misno with our white nurse's uniform. She wore a light blue shirt and, d and black denim jacket. How was your checkup? It looks like I won't have to burn you, at least. And that's too bad. I can go to school tomorrow, too. Oh, yeah? That's great she said with a sunny smile. She pulls her cell phone from a pocket of her denim jacket and glanced down at it. It's a little early, but do you want to go get lunch somewhere? You were on the night shift, right? I offered her the most basic level of courtesy. I mean, you must be wiped out. Oh, I'm fine. I'm off tomorrow. I'm still playing young. How do you feel about that restaurant over there? Up to you. Miss Meese now had driven over. She had a cute cute blue compact car, a huge contract to the a contrast to the rugged black boat my grandmother drove around. The restaurant chain was the same one we had in Tokyo, but the table we sat was much roomier than the ones there. After we had ordered, Miss Mizuno put both hands to her mouth and yawned hugely. <sighs> huh. You're just not getting enough sleep, huh? Well, that's par for the course. I'm sorry, we shouldn't have... What are you talking about? I'm the one who said we should meet up. Don't worry about it. Her coffee and sandwich finally came. Miss Misno first dumped a bag of sugar into the coffee, then took several si several sips before or biting into her egg sandwich, at which point she murmured, Let's get started then, and turned back to me. First off, I had a chat with my little brother, Takara Mizuno, who I usually barely talk to, I wanted to ask him a couple things. The class you two are in seems to have special circumstances. Special circumstances? Yep. He wouldn't give me any details, although I didn't really know what I should be asking either. Which is kind of a problem, but anyways, definitely special circumstances. You must know a what. The circumstances behind the special circumstances, you mean. I dropped my eyes and shook my head slowly. I don't really know much either. I'm pretty certain that something's going on. But I just transferred here and I guess no one's going to tell me about it yet. The girl who died at your school last week, her name was Sakuragi, right? She was your class representative for the girls? Yeah. I heard about what happened and about how you apparently witnessed it. She fell on the stairs and some horrible twist of luck made her umbrella impale her in the throat? Yes. That's what happened. It looks like he was scared of something. Your brother? If he had been shocked by the freak death of a classmate, that was only natural. But scared? What did that mean? What do you mean? It's not like I asked him outright. But somehow it was like he didn't think the accident last week was just an accident. Not an accident? There we go. Okay. I scrunched my forehead. If it wasn't an accident, then was it suicide? Or maybe murder? That was impossible. Neither of those things could have been true. It was... It was a suicide. It was a murder, and it wasn't just an accident. So what could it possibly... What was he afraid of? Who knows? Miss Mizuno cocked her head uneasily. 
Nothing specific. Hey, Sakakibara, do you believe in ghosts or curses or whatever? Is that your thing? I suddenly recalled questions Teshigawara had asked me. Was that the first day I transferred in? So-called supernatural phenomena in general? That had been the issue. That had been the same conversation, a question from Kazumi. Of course, I don't believe in ghosts or curses or whatever, or in supernatural phenomena in general, and I didn't want to start believing in them now. Sure, the seven mysteries of North Yomi it, were all kinds of strange, but they were harmless ghost stories you just expected to find in somewhere like a school. In the end, even that story about Misaki from 26 years ago had to be like that too. But then... What if the death of Yukari Sakuragi last week really wasn't just an accident? I dredged the memories back up. That day, Yukari had come flying out from the class of the classroom when she heard news of her mother's car accident. She had taken her umbrella out of the stand, and her legs tangling under her, she had first tried to come towards the east stair, which was closest to where she stood. But then, yes, she had stopped. Maybe because she had seen us standing by the window on the top of the stairs. The next moment, she had turned on her heel and ran off in the opposite direction, to the west stair. What if? I wondered. What if she had gone down the east stair following her initial impulse? Then maybe that accident wouldn't have happened. She bolted down the long hallway and run down the west stair with all that momentum, and to top it all off, the floor might have been wet right there when she slipped. The unbelievable accident had resulted from so many factors piling on to one on top of the other. So, why did Sakuragi behave that way? Why, as soon as she saw us, nay and me, had she done what she did? Have you ever heard of the name Mei Misaki? Even when the hot dog I ordered cut came, I didn't feel like picking it up, but I wet my parched mouth and throat with the iced tea I had also ordered before posing the question to Miss Mizuno. Misaki. Naturally, she reacted the same. She must have recalled the name of a girl who died in the hospital in April, whose first name was Misaki. May Misaki? Who's that? She's a girl in my class, third year of class three at North Yomi. Your brother never said anything about her? Miss Mies now puffed out one of her cheeks slightly. Remember, we hardly ever talk to each other most days. What about her, though? Did something happen? You know that thing I promised I'd tell you about out sometime? The truth is, this girl made me saki had something to do with it. Miss Mies now blinked her go goggled eyes and nodded, murmuring thoughtfully. I explained the situation to her, trying to be as simple and systematic as possible. She crossed her arms over her chest and nodded, just as she had before, then took another bite of her egg sandwich. You told me about her before, the girl with the eye patch. I don't remember when. <laughs> so, you have a little cr so you have a crush on little May, huh? What? Hey, hold on a second, lady. That's not it, I replied, a little bit indignant. It's just... There's something really strange about how she acts in the classroom. I can't stop thinking about it. We call that having a crush. I said I don't. Fine, fine. I get it. So let me try getting a handle on this. It's another way. I waited. That day at the end of April, I think it was the 27th, the girl who died in the hospital was May's cousin, Misaki Fujioka. May was very sad. And she was going to the memorial chapel to see Misaki and deliver something to her, right? Yes. And? What's so strange about the way May acts in class? I mean... I had to really think hard about how to answer. Um, I think she's just strange to start out with. But, you know what I mean. At first I thought maybe the class was kind of picking on her, or maybe they were all scared of her. Scared of her? It's not quite that either, though. Several things that I'd seen and heard since the day when I first came to North Yomi floated lazily through my mind. 
I have this friend named Teshkawara, and he called me up out of nowhere and told me to quit, pl quit paying attention to things that aren't there. What does that mean? According to her, it means she's invisible, which... Miss Mizuno folded her arms over her chest again and murmured, Mm-hmm. I pressed on. And then, with all that going on, that accident happened last week. Hmm. Well, the obvious interpretation is that it's purely coincidence. There's nothing to link the two together, is there? When you take the obvious... When you take the obvious interpretation, no. But... There's also another issue that's been bothering me. It's something that happened... And 26 years ago. And then I told her the legend of Misaki. Miss Mizuno didn't make a sound the whole time I talked. She just listened in silence. Did you know that story? That's the first time I've heard of it. I went to South Middle after all. But your little brother knows about it? Oh, you think so? I still don't have any idea how the two things are related. But there does seem to be a connection. And I... I See. Miss Mizuno drained the coffee that remained in her cup. I haven't been back to school since it happened, so I don't know what's been going on in the class right now. You haven't heard anything about it from your brother, right? This has really started to sound like a horror story. You aren't going to eat your hot dog? Oh, yeah, thanks. It wasn't for lack of hunger, that's for sure. As she watched me bite into my hot dog, Miss Mizuno said, why don't I see if I can find anything out? About what happened 26 years ago and about May. Unfortunately, I'm not very friendly with my brother, so I don't know how much he'll tell me. You're going to school tomorrow, right? Yeah. My first time going to school in a week. The thought made my anxiety ramp up instantly. And also, what is May doing right now? My chest ached dully, in a way that was different from the symptoms of a lung collapsing, or nearly collapsing. If I find anything out, I'll call you. Are you coming back to the hospital soon? This Saturday. Saturday, June 6th. Hey, did you ever see The Omen? When I was in elementary school, I saw it on TV. I don't think Damien is in our town, but... Miss Mason's face took on the novice nurse who loves horror look, and a teasing smile spread over her face. But anyway, we'll both be careful, especially for any accidents that could never... That would never usually happen. I think I get a small drink of water. Really quick. There we go. <clears throat> when we left the restaurant... The rain had stopped, and tiny bits of sunlight were peeking through the clouds in places. I accepted Miss Misno's offer to drive me home and got into the passenger seat of her car. But on the way there, I realized we were in a familiar part of town. I asked her to let me out. We were in the town of Misaki, near the doll gallery, blue eyes empty to all in the twilight of Yomi. You live in Furuchi, do you, Sakakibara? It's still pretty far. She glanced over at me dubiously, so I told her, I've been cooped up for so long, I want to walk a little. I got out of the car. I found Twilight of Yomi almost immediately. Outside the entrance, a middle-aged woman wearing bright marigold-colored clothes stood on the landing of the outdoor stairway that led up to the side of the building. Our eyes just happened to meet, or so it seemed. Is she from the doll workshop, up workshop upstairs? I wondered giving her a casual nod, and she simply climbed up the stairs in silence without the slightest reaction. I folded my collapsible umbrella up neatly and put it away in my bag, and then pushed the door open. The bell over the door rang dully, just like the last time. Hello there. The same white-haired old woman was at the table next to the entrance, and she greeted me with the same in tone of voice as last time. It was the middle of the day, and still the inside of the shop, no, I should say inside of the gallery, had the same dusky lighting as the last time I had gotten there. I had been there. What's this? We don't get many young men here. Even that was the same. Are you in middle school? No school today. Then you can go in for half price. 
Thank you. As I pulled my coin purse out of the pocket, the old woman nodded one last thing, added one more thing. You can take your time and have a look around. There aren't any other customers right now anyway. Feeling faintly lightheaded, I moved into the gallery. String instruments playing a gloomy melody, armies of dolls everywhere, both beautiful and eerie, fantastical landscapes decorating the walls. Every last detail was the same as before. Feeling as if I were trapped in a particular recurring nightmare, I set my bag down on the sofa in the back. Then, taking deep breaths for those who had no breath, I headed towards the stairs that led down to the basement, as if pulled there at last by the puppet strings. The chill air of the basement room, so like a crypt, and the dolls, or their various parts, lying all over the place, were just as I remembered them and the knee sliced depressions of the wall. The girl without the right arm, the boy with thin wings, and the lower half of his face covered. The twins joined at the abdomen, and yes, the black coffin that stood all the way in the back, and the doll shut up inside it that looked exactly like Mei Misaki. Unlike last time, I didn't feel my head clouding or my body getting much colder. But again, as if led by puppet strings, I walked over to stand before the coffin at the very back of the room. This doll had been made by Kirika, written to mean fruit in the midst. But that's what May had told me. I held my breath for a few moments, staring at the doll's face, even more waxen than the real May, at the mouth that seemed ready to speak at any moment when something happened when happened and then that was impossible to really accept from reality. From the shadows of a black coffin holding the doll, slowly, silently. How could that be? All at once, I felt another faint wave of lightheadedness. You can take your time and have a look around. The words the old woman had spoken just moments ago rang in my ears. There aren't any customers right now anyway. Of course. The old woman had said that last time I'd come too. There aren't any other customers. I was sure of it. Her words tugged faintly at my mind that day, too. There aren't any other customers. And yet... Why? Slowly, silently, from the shadow of the black coffin... Why? She appeared. Mamie Saki. She looked a little cold in this underground room, dressed in only a navy blue skirt and a white summer blouse. Her skin looked even paler than usual. What a coincidence. Meeting at a place like this again, May said, smiling faintly. A coincidence? Is that what it was? I was struggling for a response when May asked me, Why did you come here today? I'm on my way home from the hospital. I happen to be walking by, I replied, and asked her a question in return. What about you? You didn't go to school? Well, you know, I ended up not going today, she said, smiling faintly again. Are you feeling better, Sakakibara? Just enough to avoid getting hospitalized again, I guess. How's everyone in class been since that, since Sakuragi's accident? May made a low noise. Hmm, I replied. Everyone's. Scared. Scared. His beast now had said that too. It looked like he was scared of something. Scared? Of what? They think it started. What started? May abruptly turned her gaze aside. She looked unsure of how to answer. I... After a silence of several seconds, she spoke. I guess I've only ever half believed it. In the back of my mind... First that happened, then in May, you came to our school and I had told you all about that stuff. But I still didn't believe it a hundred percent. I guess I still doubted some part of it, but... She cut herself off and turned her gaze back to me. Her right eye narrowed, questioning, and I cocked my head to one side, uncomprehending. But it really does seem like it's one of those years, May continued. A hundred percent certain. Probably. I didn't know what to say. Because it started so 
May's eye narrowed again, as if challenging me. What do you think about that? But all I could do was cock my head at her. So you still don't know, huh, Sakakibara? May murmured, turning her back on me quietly. Then maybe you're not actually supposed to know. If you found out, then maybe. Hold on, I spoke up reflectively. You tell me stuff like that and then expect me to... I wanted to just shrug my shoulders to her and say, No idea. It's starting. I doubted. It's one of those years. I wish she'd cut it out with this, or with the all-knowing act already. Do you think you'll be able to go to school? May asked, her back still turning me. Yeah. I go back tomorrow. Ah. Uh, if you're going, then I should probably stay away. What? Now come on, where are you? Be careful. She turned slightly as she spoke, and you shouldn't tell people that you saw me here. Then she turned her back on me again and walked off, her feet making no sound to disappear behind the black coffin. After a few moments, I tried calling to her softly. Come on, Misaki. I took a step forward. Look, why are you... But my legs tangled slightly. A moment too late, I started to feel an odd, wobbly dizziness. Don't you feel like being sucked out of you? Everything you have inside of you? The words May had spoken the last time I had, saw, I had seen her here flowed through my spinning head like a spell. Dolls are emptiness. Their bodies and hearts are total emptiness. A void. Dolls are emptiness. Their bodies and hearts are total emptiness. A void. That emptiness is like death. Somehow I managed to take a step forward and keep my balance. Like death. With trepidation, I peer behind the coffin, but there, I found May was gone. But there was no one else there, either. The dark red curtains hanging in front of the wall were fluttering slightly in the breeze of the soft air conditioning. A shudder ran through me. If I suddenly... If I were suddenly touched by a midwinter chill. Why? Why? Ray, the minia bird, I repeated the question with her, I think, usual enthusiasm. I look at you. I'm the one who wants to know why, I glared into the cage, but she never wavered. Why? Ray? Why? Morning! Morning! After dinner, I went to the porch on the front floor on the first floor, where the signal was good, and tried calling my dad in India. Apparently his phone was turned off, though, because I called him three times, and three times didn't go through. Maybe he was still at work. Night hadn't, fall hadn't fallen yet over there. Well, whatever. I gave the idea up quickly. Even if I told him about the accident last week or the bad turn I'd taken physically, he couldn't exactly give me advice outside of that. The only thing... Thing I wanted from him, if anything, was to hear about my deceased mother's time in middle school. But of course, I was still a long way from having a concrete idea of how her stories could tie to the current events, if they even would at all. Part of me also wanted to ask if there was any pictures of my mother from back then, or maybe a yearbook. But the school would most like would be the, would be more likely to still have one of those. In fact. Yeah, if I went to the secondary library in Building Zero, I left the porch, abandoning Ray, and peered into the living room where Reiko had been watching TV for once. There was a stand-up comedy variety show on, which didn't seem like the sort of thing she would enjoy watching, but looking closer, I saw that Reiko was sunk into the sofa, both her eyes shut tight, so she was asleep. A cold breeze was blowing from the air conditioner, making the room incredibly cold. Come on, Reiko. You're going to catch a cold napping in a place like that. I was just about to leave the room to at least Isko shut the air conditioner off when... Kleichi? She called out to me. I jumped and turned around. Reiko's eyes were lazily open. When did I doze off? Oh, this is no good. No good. She shook her head and heavily. Just then, someone on TV laughed shrill. Reiko's eyebrows 
I dove into his scowl, and she picked up the remote, flicking the TV off. Are you alright? Uh-huh. Sure, I guess. Rako moved from the couch to a chair in the dining room. She poured water into the glass from the pitcher that was on the table, and swallowed some sort of pills. I kinda got this headache, she said as I watched her. It only takes this weak stuff to make it go away. And I've been getting so many headaches lately. It's getting annoying. You're just tired, aren't you? We've got all sorts of stuff to deal with. And, um... She sighed softly, then replied. I guess. More importantly. Are you alright, Koichi? You went to the hospital today, yeah? My condition is stabilized, and there are no further issues, they said. Oh, that's good. Um, Reiko? I sat down, too, in the dining room chair, directly across from her. Do you remember how you said there's a time for finding out about things? How there's a time for everything? But how can you tell when it's time? I asked the question in all seriousness, but Reiko looked back at me with a morose expression. Did I say that? She cocked her head to one side. I was bewildered. Ray's shrill voice asking, Why? rang through my mind. Was she playing dumb? Or did she really not remember? Which was it? Um, okay. Then can I ask you something I just thought of? I collected myself and went with a different question. When you were in your last year in North Yomi, what class were you in? When I was a third year? Yeah. Do you remember? When I said that, Reiko arrested her cheek in one hand, her face morose again, and replied, I was in class three. Class three? Really? Mm-hmm. So then in your year, I mean, did they say the curse of class three about your class or anything like that back then? Mm hmm Her head was still resting in her palm. Reiko seemed to be searching for an answer, but in the end, she gave a soft sigh like she had before, and said, That was fifteen years ago. I forgot. Ignoring whether or not her excuse was genuine. Fifteen years ago. All of a sudden, I felt uncomfortable, but I wasn't sure why. Fifteen years ago would have been... Oh, I see. Of course, but that was... You're going back to school tomorrow, right? Rachel asked. Yeah, that's the plan. I taught you North Yomi fundamentals, right? Do you remember what to do? Uh, yeah, I already... Even number three? Yeah. Of course I remembered. I remember number one and number two, which seemed like superstitions, and number four, which had the greatest meaning for me, and number three... I believe that one was... Obey whatever the class decides at any cost. Is that it? That's right. Reiko nodded slowly. What about it? Reiko suddenly gave a drawn-out yawn, then shook her head back and forth with his with. <laughs> Rapidly. Then, shaking it off, she said, Oh, uh, what was it? And craned her head all the way to one side. We were talking about number three of North Yomi Fundamentals. Oh, were we? Let's see, should I adhere to all of them? Really, I mean, uh, are you alright? Mm hmm. I guess. I guess I really am just pretty tired. Sorry, Koichi, I just can't do it. Lightly thumping herself on the head with a fist, a feeble smile came over Reiko's face. I started to feel irritated pained. But my emotions were more complex than just that. I could tell Reiko about May, couldn't I? In fact, I didn't have to force the subject, I often thought so, but I couldn't manage to bring it up. The end result of my internal conflict this time, once again, was I decided not to pursue it. Get a nice small drink real quick. I wasn't very good at talking to Reiko like this. She made me so nervous. The biggest reason for that was because I was 
I could suddenly see her the shadow of my see in her the shadow of my mother, whom I only knew from photographs. So see, I had already gone through the self analysis. So why did I feel that the tendency was only getting worse? It had to be a problem with me after all, or maybe. I decided to go back to my room for the night and try to get to sleep as early as I could. With that decision made, I stood up in my chair. Why? A small voice whispered, though without any deeper meaning or intention. Cut that out, Reiko said, her tone surprisingly harsh. I can't stand that bird. The next day was June 3rd, Wednesday. Mamie Saki wasn't in the classroom at lunchtime, and she hadn't left the and she hadn't left for the instant fourth period ended either. She hadn't been there all day. She was staying away today, just as she had told me yesterday. I hadn't been in school for a week, and the way in my classmates acted towards me was, to put it in a positive spin, sensible, but in a more penetrating analysis, they were acting cool and functionary. And functionary. Were you in the hospital again? No. I was resting at home. Same thing you had before. What do you call it? A spontaneous pneumothorax? I got really close to having one, but it turned out alright. So you're okay now? Yeah, thanks, but no extraneous activity. Doctor's orders. So that means I'm still sitting out of gym class. Well, I hope you feel better. Me too. Thanks. Not a single person mentioned the death of Yukari Sakuragi and her mother. The teachers were the same. The desk where Sakuragi had sat in the classroom was left empty. There weren't even any flowers still on it, like people sometimes do. Everyone was trying to avoid acknowledging her death. More than necessary, it seemed. I couldn't help interpreting their behavior that way. When lunch started, Tomohiko Kazumi was the first one to speak to me. I called out to him as he was leaving the room. Oh, hey. As he pushed the bridge of his silver-rimmed glasses as far up his nose as they could go, Cosby's stiff expression morphed into an awkward smile. You know, I'm pretty sure this is how he acted when I first met him in April, too, when he came to see me in the hospital. Having known him for a month now, I felt like he had opened up a little bit, but it felt as though he had been reset back to zero. The first time we'd ever seen each other, and now, the main thing underlying them both, I would say, was tension. The second biggest thing was what seemed like a kind of wariness. The realization hit me all at once. I'm glad you're better. I was worried about you. You were out for a whole week, so I thought maybe you relapsed. I was worried too, to be honest. I'm sick of being in the hospital. You don't really need any of the notes from class while you're out, right? Cosby said sheepishly. You're pretty good, huh? I learned some of it already at my other school. That's all. I'm not really that good. Oh, so then do you want copies of the notes? I think I'm still okay for right now. Ah, uh, okay. Even as we carried out this meaningless conversation, a stiffness never left Cosby's face. Tension and weariness maybe on top of that. Fear. The accident last week must have been really traumatic for you. I decided I was the one to bring it up. You were both class representatives, and you both came to see me at the hospital. Then for something like that. As I talked, I looked over at Sakuragi's desk. Cosme looked a little bit flustered. We're going to have to pick a new class representative for the girls. We're probably going to do that if it's a new homeroom tomorrow. Then he hurriedly broke away from me and left the classroom. A new representative, huh? Cosme and Sakuragi had practically been twins, but I suppose there were tons of people who could fill in a class rep at a middle school. Sitting at my desk, I took a cautious look around the room. It was June now, and most of the students were wearing their summer uniforms. There were girls who had constructed islands to eat at. Here, one. There, a second. A group of boys had gathered in a corner by the window to chat. There was one who was strikingly taller than the rest of them, and he was pretty tan and his hair was cut into sporty buds. That had to be Mizuno, Takedo Mizuno, from the basketball club. 
His first name was written on the character for ferocity. I momentarily considered going over to talk to him. I could use his sister to break the ice, and depending on how things went, I could talk about oh, how I met up with her yesterday, and... No, that was a bad idea. For now, what I needed to do was wait for news from Miss Mizuno. She told me, why don't I just see if I can find anything out? She said, and she and her brother weren't very close. So if I made a fumbling attempt to reach out to him now, it would just set off alarm bells in his mind and she might not be able to get anything out of him. I stuffed myself with my grandmother's homemade lunch, filled with incredible gratitude as always. Then I went out into the hallway by myself. The whole time, I felt as if little brother Mizno, by the windows, was constantly glancing over at me. And I don't think it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Just as I had done last Tuesday, I stood at the windows at the top of the east stair. There were a few clouds in the sky. It wasn't raining. But the wind was blowing too hard. Even, through the, even though the window was closed, I could hear its high, intermittent howling. Turning my back on the window and leaning against the wall, I pulled my cell phone from the pocket of my pants. I looked up Tejkalara's number in my call history, then pushed the call button without a moment's hesitation. Tejkalara was at school that day, but he hadn't spoken to me once, and he looked as though he preferred to avoid even eye contact with me. By the time I looked around after lunch started, he had already disappeared from the classroom. Seriously, who does he think he is? Name Saki? Hey. After however many attempts, he finally answered the phone. I instantly asked, where are you? Uh, no, you're not in Earth. Tell me where you are. Outside, walking around the courtyard. The yard? I turned to look out the window and scanned the ground on through the glass. There were more students milling around out there than I would have expected, so I couldn't tell where Tishkawara was. I'm coming down right now. Wait for me by the lotus pond? Um, come on, Saki. I'll be right there. I cut the call before he could say anything, anything and hurried to the place I told him to be. Just as I had instructed, Teshiguara was waiting for me at the pond where a bloody human hand was rumored to rise out of the water occasionally. The pond surface was covered by the brown leaves of water lilies, not lotuses. There were no students I recognized nearby. Apparently, he'd been walking around the courtyard alone. I tried calling you a bunch of times last week, but you never answered. I said it in the coldest voice I could manage. Teshiguara made an exaggerated gesture, bringing his hands together in front of, hi in front of him in supplication, and said, Yeah, sorry about that. But the whole time, he was trying to keep his gaze from landing on my face. Whenever he called, I was always in the middle of something. I kept thinking about it, but it's not like I could call you. I mean, you weren't feeling good, right? So, I didn't want to bother you. It sounded like a flimsy excuse to me. You promised me, I said. You said you'd tell me in June. Uh, I told you, uh, is not an answer. The bleached Moppet didn't try to hide how shaken he was. I fixed him with an uncharacteristically harsh stare. I want you to keep your promise. You're the one who offered, after all. Something happened 26 years ago. There's a popular kid named Misaki in the third year of class three that year, and they were killed in a freak accident. Then what happened? He didn't say a word. You guys said something about there being the year it started. So, what happened in third year class three after that? Hey, hold on, Sakaki. For the first time, Teshigawara looked me straight in the face. Yeah, you're right. I did promise you. I said I'd tell you once we got to June, and what I meant, and what I meant was I wanted you to sit tight the whole rest of the month. Tachigawara gave me a dejected sounding sigh. A powerful wind moaned in the sky overhead. The situation has changed. He turned his eyes away again as he said that. Things are different now than they were when I said that, so... So you're saying you want out of the promise? Yeah. How could that be? How could he? Obviously, I had a lot of trouble accepting that, but judging from the way I could see Teshkawara acting, I got the feeling that it would be pointless to try and question him anymore right now. Still, there was one question I couldn't let slide, which was, 
Remember that day you warned me to quit paying attention to things that aren't there? Tachikawara nodded silently. His expression pulled tight. You told me it's dangerous. So what did you... Just then, a crude buzzing came through the pocket of my pants. Who could that be? I ran through the names and as I pulled out my cell phone, its, on its incoming call light flashing. The name on the screen was Miss Mizuno. I'd just seen her yesterday. Oh, it's a kakibara. You're at lunch, right? Is it okay to talk to you right now? Miss Mizuno's voice sounded a little skittish. Just then. I'm at the hospital right now. Huh? I thought you had today off. I was conscious of Tashikawara listening in, so I covered my mouth with my left hand and lowered my voice. Someone called out today, so they and told me to come in. This job is seriously tough, even when you're a newbie. After moaning about the cruelty of it all, Miss Mizuno changed her tone and went on. So I stole a couple of seconds from the insanity and came up to the roof of the impatient ward. That's where I am now. What's going on? Did you- I tried talking to him last night. Your brother? About that thing? Right. When I talked to him, well, there's one thing I want to confirm with you before I say anything else. What's that? Ready? Miss Mizuno made her voice a little louder. She was definitely on the roof, or at least outside, since I could clearly hear, hear the shrill sound of the wind. That girl, May, you told me about yesterday? May Misaki? Miss Mizuno said. Is she actually there? Excuse me? I didn't know what to say to that. Yes, she's really there. Right now? Is she nearby? Are you sure? No. She didn't come to school today, so she's not there. What are you talking about? I felt my voice getting louder. Why would you ask? I told you. I talked to my brother last night. Miss Mee's no quickly gave me that information she had. I tried asking him about that thing 26 years ago and about the accident last week, but he just stalled me out of it. They just stalled me on all of it. He still looked as though he was scared of something, too. Like he was at the end of his rope. Then last of all, I tried asking about May. Crack. I heard some interference on the line, and her voice crackled. When I did that, his voice went all red, and he demanded, Why are you asking me that? There's no one like that in my class. He looked, no he looked totally serious, like I had never seen him before. So I thought maybe this girl made me Saki. Then he's lying. I saw Teshigora's face looking over at me suspiciously. I turned my back to him, then recruited my right hand, which gripped the phone, um, to completely cover my mouth. Then, he's lying. I repeat fiercely. But he was so serious. I don't see how... I don't see why he would have to lie. I heard the interference again, and Miss Mizuno's voice broke off. I didn't care. I told her, May Misaki exists. May exists. I'd seen her dozens of times. Talked to her dozens of times. I'd seen her yesterday, even. Talked to her yesterday. How could she possibly not exist? It was crazy. What? Her voice cut through the interference, sounding somewhat different than it did before. Uh, what's happening? What is it? Crack. Rumble. Crack. Miss Misno, can you hear me? Sakakibara? Her voice crackled much louder than before. I got off the roof. I'm on the elevator. I need to get back, so... Oh. Oh. So that's why his sing signal is bad. But this is... No! What? The interference grew thicker and more intense. Miss Misno's voice seemed to be swallowed up in it and then broke off. Miss Misno! I squeezed my hand tighter around the phone reflectively. Can you hear me? What's going- My words came to a stop. A strange sound was coming through the phone. It's hard to describe what it sounded like. A really strange, horrible noise. I took the phone from my ear, unable to listen anymore. What had happened? She'd gotten into the elevator, and her signal had, de had deteriorated. Was that why- What was that- Was that- what the sound was? No, before that, she terrified I put the phone back to my ear. Instantly, I heard some kind of hard, violent sound. It sounded... Yes. It was exactly as if the phone had been dropped to the floor. The interference finally grew more intense, 
and the last moment before the connection between the two phones is lost, I heard faintly but clearly the sound of Miss Nizno groaning in pain. Chapter 7, June 2 Miss Mizuno was dead. I learned that I learned the frankly debilitating truth that evening. The only information I was able to get so far was that there had been an accident at the hospital. But I think I had been prepared for the worst even before that. That phone call during lunch. There was no doubting the fact that some kind of abnormal calamity had befallen her. But no matter how many times I tried to call her back, I never got through. As a result, I had no way of finding out what happened, so I was forced to spend hours tortured by anxiety and restlessness. Miss Mizuno? The young nurse? When she heard about it, my grandmother seemed truly shocked. Up to. She had met Miz Miss Mizuno several times when she was in the hospital. When, she was ho when I had been hospitalized in April. Wow, English. Hi. Mizuno Sanai, was it? You two got along so well. She would talk to you about your books. I saw her once at the hospital, too, I think. The day I came to visit you, she was... Rachel looked extremely depressed. After dinner, she had taken the same medicine as the night before. I guess she had a headache again. She was still so young. I hope her little brothers will be okay. She ha- Oh, wait. She was still so young. I hope her little brothers will be okay. She had brothers? My grandmother asked. I replied. One named Takadu. He's in my class, actually. Oh, my. My grandmother's eyes went round. How awful. Didn't a girl from your class just pass away in an accident? I knitted my brows pensively, my, te my temples throbbing. They said there was an accident at the hospital. I wonder what it could have been. Nobody could answer. But the horrible sound I had heard over the phone at lunchtime boomed in my ear again. Then Miss Mizuno's pain moaning, fading in and out of the intense interference. Unable to bear it, I shut my eyes tightly. I thought about telling them right then what happened at lunch. As I thought it over, there was no reason for me to hesitate to m and so much over it, and yet, I didn't tell them. No, I couldn't tell them. I think because I felt something akin to guilt oh, deep down, and I couldn't shake free of it. My grandfather had been quiet, and now he learned an uh, 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 in his papery voice pressed both hands to his wrinkled, colorless forehead. When someone dies, there's a funeral. I don't... I don't want to go to any more funerals. For whatever reason, maybe because there was an, an auspicious day coming up, the wake was the day after tomorrow, and the memorial service would be the day after that, on Saturday. Saturday. Oh, right. June 6th. Did you ever see the omen? I vividly recalled the conversation Miss Mizuno and I had had at the restaurant. It was only yesterday. We'll both be careful, especially for any accidents that would never usually happen. She was dead. The day after tomorrow was her wake, and the day after that was her memorial service. It seemed so unreal. Shock was the only thing I felt at first. Emotions like sadness couldn't get a grip on me yet. I don't want to go to any more funerals. As I listened to my grandfather sluggishly repeat himself, the word funeral created a dark stain somewhere in my heart. Before I could even react, a black whirlpool had begun to turn slowly around it, until finally... How can I put it? A strange low-frequency sound rose up from everywhere at once. I closed my eyes tightly again. At the same moment, something in my mind came to a halt. Gonna take one quick sip of water. Better. <clears throat> the next day, June fourth, was an oppressive climate fill. Mm -mm. The next day, June f June fourth, an oppressive climate 
filled the classroom in third year class three within moments of starting the day. Miss Maisonelle's little brother, Takadu, hadn't come in. By the time second period was over, the rumor that he was absent because of his older sister's sudden death had spread through the class. In the third period, before starting the language arts class, the head teacher, Mr. Kobadetta, openly told everyone it was true. Mizuno's older sister met with a sudden and unfortunate incident yesterday. Instantly, an odd silence smothered the room, as if the breath of every student had crystallized in the air in an instant. Worst of all, Mandy Saki entered the room just then. Without so much as apologizing for her tardiness, without showing any self-consciousness whatsoever, she sat down in her usual seat, silent. I watched her as she went, uneasiness thrumming in my chest. Then I turned my attention to the reactions of everyone else in the class, too. Not a single one of them turned to look at May. They all had their eyes fixed, almost unnaturally, straight ahead. Ooh, excuse me. Mr. Kubadena was exactly the same. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. Mr. Kubadena was exactly the same. He didn't look at May or speak to her. It was as if... Yes... It was as if there was simply no student named Mamie Saki in this class, as if she didn't exist. When the language arts, arts class ended, I quickly got out of my seat and hurried over to May. Come with me, I said, pulling her into the hall. Ignoring whoever might be listening, I asked, Did you hear about what happened to me, this Mizuno? And to Mizuno. She cocked her head slightly and asked, What? So apparently she didn't know about it yet. The eye had not been hidden by the eye patch blinked wonderingly. She died. His older sister died yesterday. I thought I saw surprise color her face for an instant, but it disappeared almost immediately. Oh. Her voice rev revealed no emotion. Was she sick? Or was it an accident or something? They say it was an accident. Uh. Several students had clumped up near the door to the classroom. There were a couple of boys and girls whose names and faces I knew, but whom I still hadn't really talked to. Nakano, Meijima, Akazawa, Ogura, Suzira, Suzuru. Teshigawara was among them, and two. He hadn't spoken a word to me yesterday. I knew they were all shooting looks over at us, as if watching how things developed from a distance. Could it be? I had to give the idea pretty serious consideration now. Could it really be that what they saw on now was only me? And when the next class started, May had vanished from the classroom. Naturally, no one but me paid it any attention. As soon as lunch started, I went over to May's desk, farthest back in the row oh, by the window, of that face the schoolyard, and gave her desk a fresh inspection. It was a wooden desk of a completely different shape than the rest of the desks in the room. The chair that went with it though, was the same, like something that had been used dozens of years ago, an incredibly old desk and chair. Why was that? I asked myself, feeling behind in the curve. Why is May's desk the only one like this? By now, I decided to ignore the watchful eyes of those around me, so I sat down in her seat. The surface of the desk was notched all over and uneven. I doubt it was possible to fill out a task, say, or write clearly at all without a backing sheet. There was a lot of graffiti among all the cuts in the desk. Most of the graffiti was old, extremely old, like the desk. Some was written in pencil, some in pen, some carved in, probably with the tip of a compass. Some had almost vanished. Some was only a barely legible, and there are in the middle. My eyes fixed on a row of letters that looked freshly written. They were recent. They were written small, on the right edge of a desk, in blue pen. There was no real way to judge the penmanship or anything, but as soon as I saw it, I knew that may have written it. Who is the casualty? That was what she had written. I wonder what Mi what Miss Mikami's doing. From a seat beside me in the work table, Yuya Matsuki voiced his concern rhetorically. 
I wonder if she's really feeling that bad. She looked pretty out of it the other day. Fifth period was art class with Miss Binkamy, but there was no sign of her in the art room on the first floor of Building Zero yet. A different art teacher came in at the start of the period and told us Miss Minkamy is out today, before instructing us in a business-like tone that we would be having an art class study hall. We were told, each of you draw your own hand in pencil, a completely uninteresting subject, and as soon as the teacher left the room, there was apathetic sighs here and there in the room. It was a natural reaction, really. I opened my sketchbook, and then, why not after all? Rested my right my left hand on the table and stared at its every detail, but honestly, my motivation was as close to zero as you could get. If I had known, I would I'd have brought a book, though I didn't feel like it feel much like reading King or Kuntz or Lovecraft. When I looked over at Mochizuki, the Munich aficionado, I saw that he never paid and never had any intention of drawing a hand, but it was not a blank page in his sketchbook he was working on. He was working on a half-finished drawing in pen. A person. I could see at a glance that was a woman modeled on Miss Mikami. What was with this guy? I almost wound up saying it out loud. Did he seriously have a crush on her? This kid. On his teacher, who was at least ten years older than him. I guess that was up to him. Still, I was already in an un in an ambiguous mood when I heard his mumbled wondering about Miss Mikami, so... No way. Suddenly, Mochizuki looked over at me. Hey, Sakakibara. What? Miss Mikami doesn't have some kind of life-threatening disease, does she? What? Uh... I was completely flabbergasted. All I could offer was a tepid response. I'm sure she's fine. I'm sure you're right. You're probably right. Mochizuki's voice was incredibly relieved. No, you're right. It wouldn't be anything weird like that. Yeah. Are you that worried? I mean, Sakuragi and her mom both died recently. And now there's Mizuno's sister. So I figured, are you saying they're related? I cut straight to the point. There was the thing with Sakuragi and the thing in Miss Miz and Mizuno's family. But let's just say... As a for instance, that something happened to Miss Mikami. Are you telling me that there's some kind of relationship? That there's a connection there? Oh, well. Mochizuki started to answer, then shut his mouth. He turned his eyes away as if to escape my question and gave a hapless sigh. Ugh. Even this kid's got something he can't tell me. Something he can't tell me. Shut up inside him. I thought about putting the screws those to him a little bit more, but... Thinking better of it, I changed the subject. How's the art club? How many members do you have now? Just five. Mochizuki's eyes darted back to me. Are you joining? No way. You really should. If you're recruiting, forget about me. Why not me, Saki? I said it to put some pressure on him. Mochizuki reacted exactly as I, exactly as I expected. Spluttering. He went dead quiet and didn't answer. Turning his eyes away from me again, this time he didn't even breathe. She's pretty good at drawing, I went on, unconcerned. I saw some of the stuff she's got in her sketchbook. It's pretty good. Yeah, that had been in the secondary library. The day that I had passed by with, I passed by with Mochizuki and Tashiguar after art class. The drawings of beautiful girls with globes at their joints, like dolls. I'm going to give this girl huge wings. Last of all, may have told me that then. Had she drawn the wings yet? I gave up on Mochizuki, whose eyes were still turned away and who had not yet attempted to offer so much as a word in response. I shut my own textbook. Not even 30 minutes had gone by since the start of fifth period, but I had decided to abandon this independent study. Where are you going? Mochizuki asked as, asked as I stood up from my seat. The library. The secondary one. I answered deliberately curt. I need to look something up. When I told Mochizuki I had something to look up, it was pretty much the truth. The part that I had included in that pretty much was the faint hope that May might be there. But that hope was not realized. There were no students there. The only person in the ancient library was the librarian, Chibiki. Here's a face I've seen before. 
He spoke to me from behind the counter-style table that was set up in one corner. Today, again, he was tricked out in all black, his hair sprinkled with white, as straw-like as ever. He fixed his eyes on me through the lenses of his homely black-rimmed glasses. Faka Kibara, transfer student. He spoke my name. Third year class three, was it? My memory is not as bad as all that. Why aren't you in class? It's art, and um, the teacher is out today, so it's study hall. I told him what was going on, and the all-in-black librarian didn't pursue it any further. What can I do for you? He asked. It's rare that a student comes here most days. Um, there's something I'm looking for. Again, I told him in the situa- I told him the situation. I walked slowly up to the counter where he sat, then asked him, Do you have old yearbooks here? Oh, yearbooks, is it? We have a full set of them. Can people look at them? They can. Then, uh, I believe they're over there. At long last, he stood up and extended an arm in front of him. He was pointing at the bookcases covering the wall shared with the hallway, to the right of the entrance. They're on that shelf, second from the inside, I think. Somewhere around there? You probably won't need a step stool with your height. Okay, thank you. What year are you looking for? Well, I faltered a little. From 26 years ago, the one from 1972. 72? The librarian's brows knit it sharply and he looked right in my face. Why would you want to see that? Well, actually, I did everything I could to regain my equilibrium and struggled to give a harmless answer. My mom graduated from this middle school that year. And my mom, she, uh, she died young, and I don't have any photos of her, of her. So I, um, your mother? The look in the librarian's eyes seemed to soften very slightly. I see. All right. Seventy-two of all things. The last part he murmured to himself. You should find it pretty quickly, but it's not available for lending. When you're done looking at it, put it back where you found it. Understand? I will. It took maybe three or th two or three minutes before I located the yearbook I wanted and pulled it down from the shelf. I sat it down on the large reading desk and pulled up a chair. Let's see, there we go. Then, as I got my somewhat ragged breathing under control, I turned back the cover and embossed with North Yomiyama Middle School in silver foil. First of all, I looked for a page with third year class three I soon found a two-page spread, laid out with the left-hand page showing a group photo in color and the right-hand right page showing black and white photos of the students split into several groups. There were more students than now, more than 40 students in the class. The background of the group photo was somewhat outside, was somewhere outside the school. The bank of the Yomiyama River or somewhere like that. Everyone was wearing their winter uniforms. They were smiling but I could tell that there was some kind of tension to it. My mom. Where was she? I didn't, it didn't seem as though I was going to find her so easily. Just by looking at the faces, I had to consult the names written under the picture. There she was. That one. Mom. The word had slipped out of me unintentionally. Second row, fifth from the right. She wore a navy blue blazer. Exactly like the current uniform. Her hair was put up in a white beret or something. And she was smiling, too, with some sort of tension on her face. This is the first time I'd see a picture of my mom from middle school. It struck me how young she was, how childish, in fact. Adjusting her, adjusting for age, I could see that she really did resemble her younger sister, Reiko. Did you find her? The librarian asked me. Without turning around, I simply replied, yes, and returned my eyes to the list of names under the group photo. I wanted to check if the name Misaki was there, but there was no reason it would be. Misaki had died in the spring of that year, long before they had started preparing the yearbook, so there was no reason the name would be there. What class is your mother in? The librarian asked me another question. His voice was much closer than the last time. I turned around, surprised, and found that he had left the counter and come over to stand right next to me. Um, well, I heard that she was in the third year. She was in class three. 
The librarian's eyebrows drove sharply again. Hmm. Then he rested a hand on the edge of the table and peered at your book. Which one is your mother? This one. He pointed at her out in the group photo. Let's see. The librarian pushed his glasses up and, and brought his face closer to the book. Ah, Ritsko, is it? Huh? You knew her? Oh, well, you know. The librarian evaded my question and moved away from the desk. He realized that I was following his movement with my eyes and ruffled his straw like hair. Ritsko's son. I didn't know. My mom died 15 years ago, right after I was born. I see. Which means... Yes, I see. I fought back the urge to ask what it was that I saw, and dropped my eyes back to the yearbook on the table. Second row, fifth from right. I looked at my mom's face, smiling there, with an air of tension, then looked at the group of classmates pictured with her, and then... Huh? I realized something and blinked. I had half stood up in my chair, so I sat back down and looked more closely at the yearbook, which then... So there you are. So there you are, Sakagibara. The door banged open and a student came into the bell, and it came in just as the bell ending the fifth period started to ring. It was Tomihiko Kazumi. Mr. Kubadera is looking for you. He wants you to go to the teacher's office right away. You're Koichi Saku Sakakibara, correct? There were two men I'd never seen before, one of whom, the middle-aged man with a round face, spoke to me. His voice was more placating than it needed to be, intending to soothe the, att soothe the attention of its listener, but he questioned me without hesitation. You know about what happened to Miss Mizuno, who used to work at the municipal hospital? Yes. Were you close to her? She was nice to me while I was hospitalized in April, so... You talked on the phone? Yes, a few times. Yesterday afternoon, around one o'clock, you spoke with her on her cell phone. I did. I'd been summoned by Mr. Kubadera, and waiting for me when I reached the teacher's office in Building A, A had been plainclothes cops from the Criminal Affairs Bureau of the Yomiyama Police Force. Detectives, in other words. Two of them, just like the formula goes, in contrast to the jolly-looking middle-aged man with a round face, the younger one had a narrow face with a jutting chin, and large glasses with navy blue frames, which seriously made him look like a dragonfly. Their names were Oba and Takanuchi. We want to ask you some questions. Your teacher told us that was fine. Do you mind? Takanuchi had been the one to say that, cutting to the chase as soon as we had met. Just a few moments ago, it hadn't been enough. It had it wasn't bad enough to come off as brusque, but his tone smacked of the idea that he was only talking to a half man middle school or We're having the extended homeroom next, Mr. Kubadera had added. But that's fine if you need to come late if you can talk late so you can talk to them. <clears throat> I get a little drink. There we go. Okay. Almost immediately, the bell rang to start sixth period, and Mr. Kubadera handed the matter off to another male teacher and hurried out of the room. There were sofas sat in the one corner of the room, where I sat facing the detectives. The teacher who had, at, who had been asked to handle things introduced himself as Yashiro, a guidance counselor, then sat down beside me. I suppose there was no way the school was going to leave a student on his own in situations like this. You're aware that Sonai Amizuno passed away yesterday, Oba continued in his more soothing than necessary voice. Yes. And the matter of her death? No, I didn't get any details. Just that there was an accident at the hospital. I see. You didn't read the paper this morning. Takanuchi couldn't to ask. Excuse me. I shook my head silently. In fact, I re Excuse me, I'm so sorry. In fact, I realized my pa grandparents didn't have a newspaper delivered to their home. And no one to turned on the TV at night either. There was a problem with the elevator, Takanuchi informed me. 
I pretty much guess that. There have been a few whispers along those lines, sprinkled through the voices filling the classroom, but the instant I heard it, heard it said officially from the mouth of a detective, I felt a dull shock that numbed my entire body. An elevator in the imp impatient ward fell. She was the only one on it. She hit the floor with the full, full force of the fall. And then the shock of the impact also caused an iron beam to come free of the ceiling and fall on her. The young detective explained with a slight air of triumph. Unfortunately for her, it smashed into her head. There was no answer to that. The cause of death was, cerebral, was a cerebral contusion. When they recovered her from the scene of the accident, she was completely unconscious. They did everything they could uh, at the hospital, but in the end, they weren't able to save her. Um, I began timidly. Was there um, anything suspicious about the accident? Maybe that's why there were detectives investigating it, I thought. Oh no, it was just an accident, the middle-aged detective replied. An extremely sad, unfortunate accident. But when an elevator falls at the hospital, certain issues arise, such as, as determining the cause and investigating any administrative responsibility. That's what we're working on. Ah. Miss Mizuno's cell phone fell to the floor of the elevator in question. Its call history showed your name and phone n name and number, Sakatabara. Moreover, we saw that the call was placed right around 1 o'clock, exactly when the accident occurred. So we believe that you may be the last person she spoke with. Ah. Uh, once they said it aloud, it was completely obvious. The one person in the world most likely to know what had gone on right before and after the accident yesterday. They realized the person was a middle schooler she had, uh, she'd been on the phone with. Koichi Sakakibara, and it was true. I had indeed heard it happen yesterday. But wasn't it a little late for them to come see me? That thought occurred to me, too. I could pretty much imagine the chaos at the scene after the accident yesterday, but still. At their urging, I recounted what happened yes what I had experienced. How I had received a call from Miss Mizuno yesterday at lunchtime. How we had talked normally at first, and how things had suddenly changed. It was when she left me on the roof and went into the elevator. How I had heard some kind of horrible sound that almost immediately How I had heard some kind of horrible sound almost immediately, then a sound unlike the phone and had been tossed away, and then an instant later the sound of her pained moaning before the call was cut off. Each of them seemed to match up with an aspect of the accident. Did you tell anyone about it? Right after it happened, I had no idea what was going on. I tried calling her back, but I couldn't get through. Struggling to calm myself, I described my actions the day before. But I still thought something bad might have happened, so I went to find Miss Mizuno. Went to find Mizuno. Who? Takeru Mizuno. Miss Mizuno's little brother. He's in my class. I told him about what I heard over the phone, but I guess he couldn't figure out what I was saying. So he didn't take me very seriously. What are you talking about? You're not making sense. That had been the little brother Mizuno's reaction. Angry, but also incredibly confused. You need to quit feeding my sister crazy stories. You're causing a lot of problems for me. The only thing I could think to do after that was contact the hospital. The nurse's station in the inpatient ward had answered, and I tried asking for Miss Mizuno, but, they, it, but that hadn't reached her either, like I pretty much thought. And soon, things got incredibly frantic on the other end of the phone. And no matter how many times I tried to call, all I'd gotten was busy signal, and there was nothing left for me to do. She was on the roof, correct? Alba confirmed. Then she got on the elevator. And immediately. I see. The middle-aged detective nodded, taking notes. What do you think caused the accident? I asked him. That's still under investigation. The young detective answered. What we do know is that the elevator fell because the wire snapped. There are safety measures in place, so typically something like this shouldn't happen. That hospital building is decades old, though, and apparently they've been in a lot of unnecessary improvements in that time. The elevator in question was in the back of the building, and they even called it the back elevator. Patients never used it, of course, and even employees normally don't bother with it. Did you know about this elevator, Sakakibara? No, never heard of it. In any case, on top of the elevator being in... in, in Antiquated. There are some questions about whether proper maintenance have been conducted. 
I see. It really was an accident that happened there. And given that this is a public building, this raises major concerns, naturally. Still, a fatality in an elevator crash is unusual nowadays. All you can say is that she had terrible luck. We'll both be careful. The words Miss Mizuno had spoken the last time I had seen her echoed in my ears again. Especially for any accidents that could never usually happen. Sixth period had begun, and there was more than thirty minutes gone when I was released from the voluntary questioning by the detectives. I left the office and dutifully hurried away in my classroom, but when I arrived, I got a surprise. Not a single student of third year class three was in the room. Looking around, I saw their bags and stuff were still there, so they it hadn't finished early and gone home, which meant... They'd all gone to some other place together? That was all I could think of. Izumi Akazawa. Her name was written in large letters in the center of the blackboard. Izumi Akazawa. She had a slightly grown-up, forceful, glamorous persona. She had a feminine figure and was always surrounded by friends at the center of the group. Pretty much the opposite of May, huh? Despite the thought, I recalled a few things about the student named Akazawa that nagged me. The day I first come to school in May, I was pretty sure Izumi Akazawa had been absent. And then in gym class the other day, the time Yukari Sakuragi, who was sitting out of gym class with a twisted leg, had come over to me. I have to do this right, or Akazawa's gonna get mad at me. I thought I could hear the words spoken to herself in my ears. What had that been about? And that phone call I had gotten from Teshiguara about that out of the blue. I'm calling because I thought you might be in trouble. He said that, then continued. Hakazawa's pretty wound up. She might start or having some kind of hysterical episode. Oh, Sakakibara. I turned around at the sound, and there was Mr. Kubadera. He came into the classroom with him through the door at the back of the room, as if tailing me. Have you finished talking to the police? Yes. I see. Then go home now, if you'd like. Oh, um, where is everyone? And they picked a new class representative for the girls in the homeroom. Akazawa. Oh. So that's why her name was on the blackboard. Um, so then, where is everyone? But Mr. Kubadera ignored my question. You can go home for the day, he repeated. I'm sure the incident with Miss... Uh, with me is no sister is quite a shock for you, too. But you can't let yourself get too downhearted. Things will be alright if everyone pulls together. I'm sure we'll get through this. Yeah. For that. Do you agree? Although he was talking to me, Mr. Kubadera's eyes were turned, or not on me, but on the empty lectern. We need to obey whatever the class decides without fail, alright? The next day, Saturday, June 6, I stayed home from school so that I could go to the municipal hospital in Yumigaoka. If things were still normal, I might have seen Miss Mizuno again today, but... Well, that was a short little tiny paragraph. <laughs> I couldn't work up any enthusiasm to explore on my way back from the hospital, so I went straight home. I just realized that with everything going on, it had been two weeks since I had talked to my father in India. I ought to call him tonight, or maybe tomorrow. Then I could tell him about what had been going on, and you is that to ask him a little bit about my m how my mother died 15 years ago. I was thinking of these things over when I reached my grandparents' home in, k in close, okay, around 2 in the afternoon, when the front gates of the house came to into view a little way ahead, I sighed internally. A middle school-aged boy wearing a summer uniform was loitering in front of the gate, alone. He had a somewhat unsettled air about him. He kept looking up at the house, and looking down, or up at the sky. I didn't have to take a closer look. It was... What are you doing here? I asked him, and he practically jumped in the air. He was so surprised. He turned to look at me, then turned his eyes away in embarrassment. He started to leave it without... I ever saying anything, but I stopped him with a harsh order. Hold on, what's going on? You had some reason for coming here, didn't you? It was Yuya Mochizuki. He didn't run away after all. But even as I came up to him, he kept his eyes turned away, 
fidgeting and squirming, and didn't offer any response. When I came even closer, I peered into his face and lit and loaded on another question. What might be the... What might be the reason be, Mochizuki? Then finally he spoke. I was just... Uh, worried. My house is near here in the town, so I thought I might... Uh, worried? I cocked my head slightly, sarcastically. What made you worry about me? Oh, uh, well, knitting his thin, girlish eyebrows and looking per perturbed, Mochizuki dropped his voice. We're at school again today, Sakakibara. I had an appointment at the hospital all morning. Oh, but still, um... You plan to keep standing around all I'm out here talking? Come inside for a second. I invited him with a casual tone. What? Oh, okay. Just for a second, Motsuki agreed, his face a mix of smiling and tears. It looked as though my grandmother had gone out somewhere. The black Cedric was, was in the garage next to the front door. My grandfather was probably with her. I thought Re excuse me. I thought Reiko was probably in the side house, but I decided not to announce myself. I brought Mochizuki around to the backyard, where the porch was. I knew that the glass door to the porch wasn't locked during the day. It was a level of carelessness unthinkable in Tokyo. But no, I should probably chalk it up to peacefulness. We sat down next to each other on the edge of the porch, and Mochizuki almost immediately started talking, with a speed that suggested he decided to just go for it. Sakakibara, ever since you transferred to North Yomi, you must, must have thought a bunch of stuff here seemed weird. Does that mean you're going to explain it to me? I shot back, and Mochizuki's response died off. I... That's what I thought. I glared at him out of the corner of my eye. What horrible secret is everyone getting together to hide from me? That's... Again, Mochizuki got stuck, and he was silent for a short while. I'm sorry. I guess I can't say it, after all. It's just... Just what? Something happened... Something might happen soon that you'll think is really unpleasant. It's actually bad that I'm talking about it like this, but I couldn't stay quiet. What does that mean? We talked about it at the meeting two days ago. So, you mean the homeroom in six period two days ago? When everyone left to go to the conference room? Yeah, Mojizuki nodded apologetically. We knew you were going to be late since you were talking to the police. So that's how the idea came up. Akazawa and some of the others said we needed to talk up without you around. That we should probably go somewhere else so that there's no, there wouldn't be any problems if you came back in the middle of it. Hmm. <laughs> Which meant that Mr. Kubudera had, had been on board with the suggestion too. And? I can't say any more. Mochizuki bowed his head and let out a feeble sigh. But even if something bad happens to you after this, we need you to put up with it. How can you even say that? Just tell yourself that's for everyone's benefit, please. For everyone? <clears throat> for everyone's... I offered him a phrase that came to mind just then. So that's a decision by the class I have to obey no matter what? Yeah. Hmm, what to do? I stood up on my seat on the edge of the porch and stretched, reaching slightly towards the cloudy sky. This is a time when I could have, have actually used Ray's encouragement to cheer up, but this was the one time that she probably was utterly silent in her cage. Well, I guess I won't ask you anything more about it then. I turned to look at Mochizuki. Can I ask you a favor too? What kind? I want a copy of the class list. Mochizuki looked down and looked thrown at that, but and he nodded once immediately. You never got one, did you? Nope. Then you shouldn't really be asking me for... Listen up, kid. I interrupt him. I'll worry about me, and I can tell you I've got some pretty touchy emotional issues going on. So, Mochizuki was opening his mouth to reply when a gentle electronic sound played in inside the bag resting on his lap. Oh, he made a noise, and then opened his bag. The next moment, he was holding a silver cell phone. I didn't know he had a cell. Kind of. It's wireless a handset to a landline, he answered, and I accepted the call. After a moment, Mochizuki cried, He what? Sounding very surprised. I wonder what had happened. I was preparing myself for what, for whatever was coming, 
When I saw the color in Mochizuki's face drain visibly, the phone still pressed to his ear. Then at last, that was Kazumi, Mochizuki told me. His voice smothered and low, as though he were being crushed flat. He told me that Takabayashi died. He had a heart attack at his house. Oh, shit. <laughs> Ikuo Takabayashi. He had had a weak heart ever since he was little and had often been out of school. Last year, his condition had gotten much better, but the last two or three days, it had taken a sudden downturn until he had an attack that led to his death. The sudden death of his classmate, of this classmate, whom I hardly ever talked to, was followed by the death of Miss Misno in the elevator accident at the hospital. Thus, there were two deaths of June for third year, class three this year. Let's see what we have, because I may end it here, or I may squeeze in one more chapter. Wait. Wait a minute. Ooh, that's a very, very chunky bit. But, oh yeah, we can wrap it up right, right after this one. Okay, so we can squeeze in one more chapter, and then we'll wrap it up for the night. We have plenty of time, and there's another interlude where um, the chapter that I'm on ends. So that is a, pr I'd say that's a pretty good time to end, end the stream and wrap it up for next time. Oh, actually. Let me see. Early to, um, hmm. actually, hmm. yeah, I guess we can see these two out. We have plenty of time. Besides, these streams are meant to be real long. <laughs> Besides, I'm in a reading cozy mood, so yay. <laughs> <clears throat> Chapter 8, June 3. I ran into Miss Mikami, who had been out of school for so many days that morning on the stairs. It was the start of the week, Monday, June 8th. It was on the landing between the second and third floors of the east stair in Building C. I was going up and Miss Mikami was coming down. It was just slightly before 8.30. Oh, good morning. Flustered, I gave her an, unapolo an unintentionally awkward greeting. Miss Mikami came to a stop and looked down at me as though she had seen something odd, but her eyes shifted immediately away from me and floated unnaturally in space. Good morning. Uh, and you're early. The warning bell hasn't even rung yet. I mean, she didn't greet me or respond in any way. I thought it was a little strange, but I couldn't ask her anything else was wrong. But I couldn't ask her if anything was wrong here in the stairwell either. There was a brief, incredibly uncomfortable, or rather embarrassing moment. But then, finally, we went past each other, Miss Mikami never saying a word. That same instant, the bell began to ring. Obvious question number one: Why at this hour was the teacher coming down the stairs? The short homeroom period was starting now. And yet she was moving away from the classroom, not towards it. Why? There were still several kids hanging around in the hall on the third floor, but they were all from the neighboring classes, and no one and I recognized from class three was among them. Was May here today? I wondered. Was she going to show herself at school, or... Thinking about it without really thinking, I opened the door at the back of the classroom. I was surprised. This surprise was the exact opposite of the one I had last Thursday when the detectives from Yomiyama Police Department had released me from questioning and I had come back to the classroom. That day, I had been surprised that not a single person from my class was in the room in the middle of sixth period. This was the opposite, meaning that e even though only the fir very first morning bell rung, nearly everyone was in the classroom already, and they were all sitting at their desk, totally disciplined and silent. Oh. I may sound inadvertently, and a few students turned around to look at me, but they gave no more reaction and than that and turned their and turned back around right away. Mr. Kubadera was standing next to the teacher's platform. There were two students standing on top of the platform, Tomihiko Kazumi and the new class rep 
representative for the girls, Izumi Akazawa. Extremely confused by the weird atmosphere in the silent classroom, I slowly moved to sit at my own desk. So that is what we'll all be doing. Are there any? No, we said enough, I'm sure. Kazumi said from the platform. I heard something fearful in his voice. Beside him, Akazawa stood uh, slightly at an angle, her arms across her chest. Something about her looked... To use a slightly anachronistic phrase, like a bandit queen. I lightly, po I lightly poked the back of the student in front of me, then asked in a whisper, Did something happen this morning? But the boy, named Okui, didn't turn around or respond. This is why Miss Mikami had been coming downstairs anyway. Hey, the light bulb up went on for that, at least. As the assistant teacher, she had been present for the class meeting until a few moments ago, and then... I swept my eyes fur furtively around the room. As expected, Bay wasn't there. There were two other empty seats, Yukari Sakuragi and... Right, the boy who had died suddenly over this weekend, Ikuo Takabayashi. Kazumi and Akazawa uh, came down from the platform and went back to their seats. Mr. Kubadera took their place in the center of the platform. It was a brief two months, but we should all offer our thoughts and prayers for Takabayashi, who studied with us in this room. Mr. Kubadera strung the words together with a solemn expression, and yet, somehow, sounded as though he was reading an example sentence out of a textbook. His memorial service will be at 10 o'clock this morning, so Kazumi and Akazawa will attend on the class behalf. I'll be going as well. Should you need anything during that time, please talk to Miss Mikami. Are there any questions? The classroom remained utterly silent. Though he had been addressing everyone, Mr. Kubadera was looking at, at, the, at an angle up at the ceiling, and his eyes never moved. We've had another sad event, but we can all pull through it without losing heart, and certainly without giving up, if everyone works together. Pull through without giving up? If everyone works together? Hmm. I couldn't quite pinpoint what he meant by that. Now then, we must all respect the decision of class, even Miss Mikami, who was in a very difficult position, told us earlier that she would do whatever possible. So, are there any questions? After the third repetition of, are there any questions, Mr. Kubadera lowered his gaze to the students' faces for the first time, probably every student but me, all probably wearing the same solemn expression as her teacher, nodded deeply. Ah, so I really did, I hadn't understood what he was getting at. Even so, this is not exactly an atmosphere where I could put my a hand up and declare, Question! Right up until he left the classroom a few minutes later, Mr. Kubadera never once looked my way. I don't think it was my imagination. First period was social studies. When the class ended, I immediately stood up and called to Yuya Mochizuki. After receiving the phone call two days ago on Saturday, when he learned of Takabayashi's death, he had hurried home, his face is ashen. Obviously, the news had bothered him, but then, in a certain sense, his reaction was extremely honest. He must have heard me call him, but he didn't react at all. He looked around, seeming twitchy, then scurried out of the room, as if fleeing from me. It was driving me crazy chasing him down, so I let him go. What's his deal? That was all I thought of at, and thought, thought of it at the time. They really didn't want people to find out that he'd snuck over to my house on Saturday. But that wasn't the end of it. Between the end of that class and lunch, I had become uncomfortably aware of something. It wasn't just Mochizuki. For instance, the boy in front of me, Okui, before second period started, I poked him in the back again and asked, Got a second? But he didn't turn around. What's up with him? I frowned. Okui had chronic asthma, I guess, so he would probably... So he would use a portable inhaler, even during classes. I, at least, had felt a kind of kinship with him as a fellow sufferer of a respiratory condition. But now, what's up with the cold shoulder treatment? I was vaguely annoyed, but even so, there was nothing more than one example. In other words, not a single person in the class ever came over to talk to me. Even if I tried to talk to them, they didn't react at all. Like what? Like Wakoi. Or they left without saying another word, like Mochizuki. 
Even people whom I've chatted with pretty casually up until last week, like Cosme and Teshguara and a couple of others. At lunch, I tried calling Teshguara on his cell phone, but all I got was a standard message, message that this phone may be turned off or in an area without adequate signal. I tried calling him back three times during the break and got the message three times. I spotted Mochizuki and called out to him again, but, just like before, he didn't respond. And so it went all day. In the end, I never got a full conversation with anyone from class that day. Really, forget that. I was never even once called on by a teacher, and so pretty much never spoke out loud, except to talk to myself. Even if I did talk, no one answered me. And that treatment just went on and on. Given all that, I was forced to take, take a fresh look at things. To consider the alienness enigma surrounding Mei Misaki, whether piece by piece or the overall picture of it that I had detected since first was becoming a part of the third year class three, mm, excuse me, at the beginning of May, to rethink what, excuse me, to rethink what it meant, which I had almost but never quite managed to grasp all, all this month. What lay behind it and the form of this reality that encompassed it all? What, become, what became my focus was the questions which shouldn't have needed asking of whether or not Mamie Saki existed. Was she there? Wasn't she? Was she present in this class, in this world, or wasn't she? So many questions that had, settled, that had started to bother me as soon as I transferred here, I, should, I couldn't even start to list them all. Here was someone that not a single person in the class had any contact with or even tried to. Thinking back on it now, I had never once seen anyone from class go up to her or talk to her or call her name or even say it out loud. And the reactions everyone had when, in the midst of this treatment, I approached her or talked about her. The reactions of Kazumi and Teshiguara the first day, for instance, when I spied May on the bench in front of Building Zero and talked to her. The reaction of Yukari Sakuragi the same day when I spoke of May's name in conversation while we sat out in gym class. The reactions of Teshiguara and Mochizuki. Had it been the next day? When I had gone to the secondary library after seeing May there, and there were others, a lot of others. In the end, Teshiguara had been thoughtful enough to call and give me a warning. Quit paying attention to things that aren't there. It's dangerous. And there was what Miss Mizuno's little brother, Takedo, had said at her, too. He demanded, Why are you asking me that? There's no one like that in my class. He looked totally serious. Like I'd never seen him before. Is she actually there? The way no one made contact with May, or even tried to, wasn't limited exclusively to the students. Overall, the teachers involved with class, third year class three seemed to do the same. None of the teachers ever took attendance at the start of class by calling out names, so they never spoke the name May Misaki. I had never yet seen May get called on in class to read from the test or solve a text or solve a problem. I couldn't fault her for going up to the roof by herself during gym class instead of watching from nearby. Even if she was late to class or skipped completely or left in the middle of a test or was absent for days at a time, neither the teachers nor the students seemed to take any notice. The circumstances under which I first encountered her at the hospital that and it probably helped, and even though I believe it was impossible, there was times when I considered the possibility of the non-existence of Mamie Saki. Because I don't exist. She even said it herself at one point. To them, I'm invisible. You're the only one who sees me, Sakakibara. What will you do now? And I had been firsthand the uncanny way. And I had seen firsthand the uncanny way she suddenly appeared and vanished in the basement room in Twilight of Yomi. Maybe Mamie Saki really isn't there and she doesn't exist, after all. Maybe she is like a ghost that only I can see in here and not real at all. The fact that her desk was the only one in the whole classroom that was such an incredibly old model and the fact that the name and tag pinned to her chest was made of such stained, wrinkly paper seemed to corroborate the idea somehow. However, thinking about it realistically, no. There was no way such a ridiculous as thing could be true. Which, in which case, I had to explain all the various events and facts some other way. In fact, there was a conclusion that made more, much more sense 
thinking about things this way. Mamie Saki is there. She really does exist. But everyone around her deliberately acts as if there's no such thing as Mamie Saki. That was the conclusion. I even wondered if this was some sort of bullying, which you hear her so much about. Bullying in the form of every member of the class flat out ignoring her. But I was pretty sure I'd talked to Miss Nizuno about this, too. Even if that were the case, there was still something strange about it. I've been dragged into that Sakakibara issue last year, and have real experiences of how terrible that made me feel. So maybe that was just like, just making me oversensitive. This is totally unlike a simple bullying by snubbing. This is going to sound vague, but something in the air around this case was very different. Too different. It could be that, that they're all afraid of her. Oh right, Miss Mizuno had said something like that too. Anyway, did May Misaki exist or not? I pondered over which was true and which was false, but it was incredibly hard to figure out the answer. That was the problem, unless I took some sort of device of decisive action. I wavered again and again, and between the two the theories, between the opposite and extremes, swaying by the situation or my state of mind, and in the moment, telling myself I didn't have a choice, but today at last, I felt as if I reached if at least one answer thanks to my own visceral experience. I couldn't say I had it all, but I felt as if I understood the shape of what lay at its heart. That being, in other words, this. What was happening to me? Something like this must have been happening to May this whole time. To test it out, I stood up from my seat without asking in the middle of sixth period language arts as class and left the room. A minor commotion popped up across was the room momentarily, but Mr. Kubadera didn't say a word to approach me. To reproach me. Ah, so it was true. I went over to the window in the hallway and looked up at the rainy sky toward where the low clouds were piling. I was feeling pretty depressed, but on the other hand, my heart felt a little lighter. I thought I now understood what is this to a certain degree. The next question was, Why? Exactly as sixth period ended, I went mutely back into the classroom. Mr. Kubadera left without saying anything to me, or even sparing me a glance, as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. I headed to my desk to grab my bag, when by chance my eyes met Mochizuki's as he was getting his things together to go home. But just like before, he swiftly turned his eyes away, but as he did it, his lips moved slightly, briefly. I heard the word sorry in the movement. Something might happen soon that you think is very um, that you'll think is very unpleasant. The words Mochizuki had spoken to me when I had seen him on the Saturday rose unbidden. But even if something bad happens to you after this, we need you to put up with it. He had told me that, looking very serious, hanging his head and sighing feebly. Just tell yourself that it's for everyone's benefit, please. For everyone's benefit. Maybe the answer to why laid there. I went back to my desk and stuffed my textbook and notes into my bag. Then, checking to make sure I had everything, I glanced inside my desk and... I noticed something that I had no memory of putting in my desk. There were two sheets of paper folded in half. When I took them out and opened them, a whispered sound escaped me. Oh! I looked around quickly, but Mochizuki wasn't in the room. The two sheets of paper were a copy of the class list for third year class three. Mochizuki must have done this giving me what I had asked him for on Saturday. On the back of the first sheet, he had written something out in green pen. His handwriting was pretty bad, and it was all scribbly. But I could barely make out what, had, what he had written there. I'm sorry. Ask me, Saki, what's going on. I looked around one more time, then unconsciously lowered my voice and murmured, Okay. He had clearly written Misaki on the paper. Her name was being conveyed to me point blank by a third party in the class. The existence of Mei Misaki was being directly acknowledged. This was the first time that it had happened. I do believe Mei is there after all. She really does exist. When I came to my senses, I fought back fiercely against the growing threat of tears. I turned the paper over to the front and checked the list of students' names. I found it right away. The name, Mamie Saki, was written there, unmistakably, but it was written between two rows and her address and phone number, are written beside her name, were struck through with two lines. 
What does this mean? How was I supposed to interpret this? Despite the strike through, I could read the address and phone number written there easily enough. 44 Misaki Yomiyama. That was May Misaki's address. Obviously I knew of a town May Misaki. Obviously I knew of a town Misaki. And I also had some recollections of the area in the 404 block. I was pretty sure of it. Blue eyes empty all in the twilight of Yomi. The building with the doll gallery was in fact May's house. A woman who might have been May's mother answered the phone. Um, this is Misaki. Is May here? Is May there? My name is Sakatabara. I'm in her class. I'm sorry, she replied, her voice sounding slightly taken aback, or maybe uneasy. Sakakibara, you said? Koichi Sakatabara. Yes, I'm the third year class three at North Yomi with, um, this is the Misaki household, right? It is. Um, is May there right now? I'm not sure. She didn't come to school today, so if she's there, could you put her on the line? Once I figured out her address and phone number, there was no way I was putting this off. I left the school building and went into an unfrequented corner of the schoolyard, where I quickly dialed the number on the class list to my cell phone. The woman who might have been her mother stalled, sounding more than a little confused. I'm not sure. I gave her one more push. Please, ma'am. After a moment, she said, All right, hold on, please. There was a long pause after that, and I listened to a crackly a version of Ferdis, even though I know the name of the song, play on a loop, until finally, Hello. I heard May's voice in my ear. My grip tightened on my cell phone. Uh, this is Sakakibara. This is Sakakibara. Sorry to call you out of the blue like this. There was a weird pause for two or three seconds. Then she curtly asked, What do you want? I want to see you, I replied, refusing in a waiver. There's something I want to ask you about. You have something to ask me? Yeah, I followed that up right away. That place is your house, right? The doll gallery in Misaki? I thought you already knew that. In the back of my mind, maybe. But I wasn't sure until I saw the class list. Motsuki gave me a copy. But he told me to ask you what's going on. Oh, really? Her reaction was apathetic, or more like a deliberate play at being uninterested. In contrast, I got louder. Did you hear that Ik Ikuo Takabayashi died? What? This time I got the right reaction. A short burst of surprise. Apparently, she hadn't learned about him. It was sudden. On Saturday afternoon of a heart attack, though they said he had always been pretty sick. Oh. She returned to her distant demeanor, even more staunchly, staunchly than before, it seemed. The second one to die in June. The second one to die in June, meaning that Miss Mizuno had been the first? And then today, I went on undaunted. When I went to school, the class was acting weird. It was as if everyone agreed to act as if I wasn't there. You? Yeah. The whole day, as soon as I got there. So I figure maybe it's the same as what they're doing to you. A brief silence intervened, and then last, and then at last. So they decided to try that, May said, her voice a heavy sigh. What do you mean? I asked, putting force behind my words. Why, why would they all, all do something like this? I tried weighing in the length of a previous silence, but there was no answer. This time, I held my voice in check more. Anyway, that's why I wanted to see you and ask what's going on. No answer. Come on, can we meet up? Still nothing. Come on, Misaki. Fine. Her voice was thin when she answered. Where are you right now? Still at school. I'm just about to leave. Then why don't you come here? You know how to get here, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. In 30 minutes, then I say. In the room in the basement, all right? Perfect. I'm leaving now. I'll tell my or Grandma Amine you're coming. I'll be waiting. Amine was written with the characters for At the Root of Heaven. That was something I found out later. The word Grandma reminded me immediately of the old woman greeting visitors at the table next to the entrance. Take a nice sip.
awesome. And so it was that I visited Blue Eyes Empty to All in the Twilight of Yomi for the third time. The doorbell ringing dully, the voice of a white-haired old woman greeting me, the twilight dimness within the gallery at the cusp of sunset. Hey, it's downstairs, the old woman said when she saw my face. You go on in. No need to pay the fee. There were no visitors in the gal a gallery in the first floor. There aren't any other customers right now anyway. Right. The old woman had twice told me that, the two times I had come here before. That there weren't any other customers, and yet, when I had gone down to the basement, may have been there on both of occasions. I felt a, light, a slight nagging in my mind about why that could be, and I found it strange, and because of that, my mind had been inclined, however, slightly towards the non-existence of Mamie Saki, but the answer had been the simplest thing imaginable. Now that I knew, there was nothing strange about it at all. There hadn't been any secret meaning in the old woman's words, she had simply given me the bare facts at the time. There aren't any other customers anyway. She had been right. Because May wasn't a customer, this building, including this gallery, was her home. I slipped down I slipped between the ranks of dolls on quiet steps, heading for the back staircase, once again consciously taking deep breaths for the lifeless dolls. The music playing in the museum today was not string music. It was a haunting female vocalist. The lyrics, backed by an equally haunting melody, weren't in English or Japanese. It might have been French. It was a little before four in the afternoon, and in the display room in the crypt, in a crypt-like basement, sunk in a greater chill than the first floor, in the very center of the room, May stood alone, wearing a thick, black, long-sleeved shirt and black jeans. This is the first time I'd seen her dressed in anything outside of her school uniform. Fighting back the tension rising uncontrollably within me, I raised a hand in a casual wave. Hey. Well, she asked me with the faintest of smiles. How does it feel to not exist? Hi there, call me Simpia or Daddy. Hi, welcome in. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> How does it feel to not exist? It doesn't feel great, I replied, deliberately pursing my lips at her. But even so, I feel... I kind of feel like a weight has been lifted. Oh? Why is that? Because now I know that May Misaki exists. However, even so, it could be that the girl who was there in front of me really usually isn't there. The doubt flitted through my mind, whispering it was whispering though it was. It's definitely a little spooky. It's got a very, it's a very mysterious, it's a very mysterious book. There's a mystery going on and we are just now getting a few clues and we're starting to unravel it. So let's get started in this. Even so, it could be that the girl who's there in front of me really truly isn't there. The doubt flitted through my mind, whispered though it was. I blinked harshly to banish the thought, then fixed my eyes squarely on May and took a step closer. The first time I met you here, I spoke the words just so I could hear myself say them. You told me, I come down here sometimes, since I don't hate it in here. That day, you didn't have your bag with you, even though you had come, and just come from school, which tells me that ordinarily, you live on the upper floors of this building and come down here sometimes. That day, you came home and put down your bag, and then, because you were in the mood, you came down here. That's fine, no worries. If anything, this is um this stream as well as other past streams will be uploaded to my YouTube. I've been very far behind on uploading them, but there will definitely be quite a few uploaded tonight. That way, you know, they're all there for your perusal and you can always listen in on them at any time. And of course, since this is a quiet reading stream, you're welcome to use this as ASMR ambiance to help you sleep, but that is up to you. Either way, we are willing to accommodate for everyone when it comes to these streams. That way, everyone is included. That's the goal. Everyone deserves the good vibes. <laughs> okay, let me see. Where was I? There we go. Obviously. Another faint smile touched May's face as she nodded. I went on. When I asked you if you lived nearby, you told me, well, yeah. 
that was look we use the fur uh, third floor of his building as our house there's nothing wrong with saying it's nearby is there yeah so that's what you meant that old woman who's always next to the door you called her grandma amane she's my mom's aunt which makes her my great aunt oh, excuse me my mom's mom died and young, so as far as I'm concerned, she's like my grandma. And they spoke diffidently and without faltering. Bright lights aren't good for her eyes, so she started wearing those glasses all the time. She says she can tell people apart just fine, so I guess it doesn't affect her work. Was that your mom on the phone? You surprise her. I never really get calls from kids at school. Oh, um, maybe I'm just imagining things, but is your mom... Is she what? I mean, you're, is your mom the one who makes the dolls here? That critic apart person. Yeah, May nodded without apology. Kuriko is her stage name, I guess you could say. Her real name is a lot more common. She spends most of her day holed up in that workshop on the second floor, making dolls and painting pictures wherever else. She's a weirdo. <laughs> Does the M in the Studio M stand for me? Stand for Misaki? Not so complicated, huh? The middle-aged woman in the marigold on colored clothes who's been on the landing of the outside stairs the second time I'd come here. I had already figured out she was involved in this doll studio, but could that have been May's mother, the doll maker Karika herself? And what about your dad? May's eyes slipped away. Same as yours, she replied. You mean he's overseas? I think he's in Germany right now. He's out of Japan more than half a year, half a year, and then he's in Tokyo for more than half of what's left. Does he work in trade or something? I don't know. I'm not really clear on what his job is, but I guess he's got ton of money. He got tons of money because he built this place and lets my mom do whatever she wants. Wow. He could call his family, but it doesn't really feel connected, which is fine. The fog, like watery ink, that. It always surrounded the character of Mei Misaki. For some reason, I felt faintly confused at the realization that was lifting slightly. Of course, I can speak a bit louder. <laughs> <clears throat> Wait, actually, let me adjust the ambiance just a little bit. There we go. How's that? Is that a little better? Is that a little bit better? I should be... There we go. I should have fixed the volume on that one, so let me see. <clears throat> let's see, where was I just at? There we go. You want to go to the third floor? May asked. Or did you want to keep talking here? Uh, that's okay. No problem! You can't really handle this place, can you, Sakakibara? It's not that I can't handle it. But you're not used to it yet, are you? To the air in this place packs with the emptiness of the dolls? You must have a lot more questions. Um, yeah, I do. Then, May turned silently on her heel. She started to walk off towards the back of the room. She went to one side of the black coffin that held the doll of a young girl that looked like her. Then she disappeared. Lagging by several beats, I hurried after her. Behind the coffin, the deep red curtain hanging over the wall was swaying slightly again today. In the breeze from the air conditioning, May glanced back at me, then pulled the curtain open without a word, and then a cream-colored steel door. There was a rectangular plastic button on the wall beside the door. Did you know this is here? May asked and she pushed the button. I nodded to her, my face scrunched up. When I came over before, you disappeared back here. So I checked behind the curtains that day. With a low whir of a motor, the iron doors opened to either side. It was the door to the elevator that linked the basement with the upper floors. Come along, Sakakibara. May got into the elevator, then gestured for me to join her. We can talk things over upstairs. Three black leather sofas were set around the low glass top table. There was one two seater and two single seaters. After plopping into one of the single seaters, May gave a short sigh and then looked at me. Go ahead, sit down at least. Oh, right. 
Do you want anything to drink? Oh no, I'm fine. I'm thirsty. Do you want lemon tea? Tea with milk? Um, whichever. We come up to the third floor, or on the elevator, to the Misaki family home. My first impression was how the place seemed barely lived in, if at all. We moved into the spacious living room, dining room. The furniture was unpleasantly sparse for the amount of space they had. And, to top it off, every detail of the room was too precisely arranged. Even the carelessness of a TV remote being tossed to the, to the court center of a table seemed unnatural. The windows were all closed and the air conditioning is on. It was only... It was still only early June, but the air conditioning was running surprisingly hard. May stood up from so the sofa and went into the kitchen, then immediately returned with two cans of black tea. Here. She set one on in front of me, then pulling the tab off her own, she plopped back onto the sofa. So, May took a swig of her tea, then looked at me with a cool gaze. What do you want to talk about first? Oh, well. Why don't you ask me questions? Maybe that will be easier. I thought you hated being interrogated. I do hate it, but today, I'll allow it. May spoke in a treacherly tone, then smiled in amusement. Drawn, drawn in, my attention was easing, but I quickly got up the ball and straightened my posture. All right, let me confirm something again, I said. May Misaki, you're alive, right? Did you think maybe I was a ghost? I'm not going to say that I didn't have my doubts sometimes, to be honest. I guess I can't blame you. May smiled in amusement again. But now all your doubts are gone, I hope. If we're talking in the level of whether or not I exist, then absolutely, I'm alive. A, fl a real flesh and blood human being. The only people who think I'm not there are the ones in third year class three at North Yomi. Though actually, that was supposed to have included you too, Sakahibara. Give me a moment, I just gotta plug in my phone, I'm so sorry. <laughs> just saw out of the corner of my eye that my phone was dying, so I'm gonna get that plugged in. Okay, I'm happy now. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Alright. Me? Yeah. But that failed pretty early on. Hmm, excuse me. Now you're like me, and it's hard to explain. I noted down the words that stuck out to me, failed, like me, in the corner of my mind and asked May another question. When did it start? When did everyone in class start pretending that no student named May Misaki existed? Has it always been that way? What do you mean always? Like, as soon as you started third year, or before that. Once we joined third year class three, of course, but it wasn't right away. There was no longer a smile on May's face as she answered. When the new semester had just started, we thought this year was going to be an off year, but then we found out it probably wasn't going to be, and the discussions wrapped up in April. So to be accurate, it started on May 1st. May 1st? You got out of the hospital and first came to North Yomi on the 6th, right? Yeah. Friday. The week before that was the first day of the month. There was a three-day weekend after that, so effectively, that was the third day. It started that recently. That threw me in for quite a loop. I got the idea somehow that this had been going on for longer, at least before I came to this town, and in, an un in a sustained way. A lot of stuff of must have seemed strange to you after that first day. Well, that's true. I nodded deeply to underscore or comment. Every time I talked to you or said your name, Cosme and Tashguara, everyone around me would react so weirdly. It looked like they wanted to say something, but nobody ever did. They wanted to tell you, but they just couldn't do it. I think that's how it turned out. They wound up cutting their own throats. They should have just told you everything before you came to the school. They're paying for it now. What do you mean? You should have done like everyone else and treated me like I'm not there. It doesn't work otherwise. But up till then, I don't think any of them were or taking it that seriously. Yeah, it's no worries. It's, I don't mind anybody, anybody being on Lurk at all. If anything, it's just nice background noise. Whether you're here to chat or to Lurk, no big deal. You're always welcome here. Remember what I told you? How even I only half believed it deep down? How I didn't buy into it 100%? She was right. 
I did remember her saying those words, but it's not just bullying, is it? I pushed on with my questions. No, I don't think anyone was thinking of it like that. Then why were you the target? we'll wrap up right at the interlude because I'm starting to feel my voice is starting to feel a little tired so I'll probably stop it right at the interlude if anything that's still a good place to stop <clears throat> so then why are you the target Meg cocked her head slightly who knows it's kind of just the way things worked out but I never interacted with much much with anyone. Anyway, and plus my name just happens to be Misaki too, so maybe it seemed perfect. In a way, it almost makes things easier for me too. Easier? You can't... I can't mean that. And that's right, you can't. There's no way it's a good thing that the kids in class and even the teachers are ganging up and ignoring a single student. My voice grew rougher as I spoke, but may allow, uh, let it wash past her. I'm pretty sure the teachers who deal with Class 3 spread the word through different channels, as the students do. Her tone, seemed, her tone was stubbornly detached. For example, not taking class attendance by roll call. There are teachers who do roll call in other classes, but they don't do it in Class 3. You know, so they don't have to call my name. Class 3 is the only one that doesn't have to stand and greet, too. It's the same reason the teachers never go down on the rows and call on us in order, no matter what the class we're in. I will never be called on, and if I'm absent or I leave halfway through the class, no one's going to say a word about it, and I'm excused from all cleaning rotations and everything else. The teachers have reached that understanding amongst themselves, and when the midterms rolled around, I guess they weren't allowed to excuse me from that, but they didn't and care how lazy I was when I filled out answer sheets just to get out of there, did they? Just like everything else. So gym class two then? Gym class what? Since they split gym class into boys and girls, I heard that class one and class two have gym together. Class four and class five have their own gym together. But class three is the only one by itself. I thought that was kind of weird. You could argue that one class was meant to be the odd one out, since there's an uneven number. But why would it be class three? So other classes don't get pulled in. So the number of students affected doesn't go up. Maybe they do it out of some kind of concern like that. Although, there's always been an arrangement for gym class that the person who's not there doesn't participate and sits out whenever they can. An arrangement, huh? That word called up a memory. Obey whatever the class decides. The third, North Yomi Fundamental that Reiko had taught me. And then last week, Thursday, when the classroom was empty, Mr. Kubadera had said, we need to obey whatever the class decides without fail, all right? I let out a deep sigh, feeling a deep sigh, feeling overwhelmed, and reaching out for the can of tea May had brought me. It was bitingly cold lemon tea. I pulled a tab off the top and drank half the can in one go. If we go through listing every single thing, I don't think we're ever going to finish. I looked back at May's face. Basically, the same thing that's happening to you since the beginning of May started happening to me happening to me this morning. So with everything I went through today, I felt like I pretty, I had a pretty good idea of what was going on. But the thing I still don't understand is why are they doing that? Yes, the question is why? It wasn't simple bullying. May, the one going through it, had even said so, and I agreed. But on the other hand, the students and the teachers had agreed to treat one particular student as if they're not there. In a normal t context, no, that wasn't simple bullying. It was heinous, over-the-top bullying. That was why my voice had gotten so raw before when it did. There's no way doing something like that is a good thing, but... Thinking about, it, about this by forcing the title of our concept of bullying onto it, at least, was wrong. It didn't make sense. But that fact was inescapable. There was probably no malice in the way they were, in what they were doing, whether a student or a teacher, 
like in so-called bullying, if there was no con and contempt or mockery of their target, then there was no intent to try and strengthen their group ties by singling her out. That's why, that's how I thought of it. What they had instead was fear and dread. That's also how I saw it. Before I thought, I thought they were afraid of May, but it wasn't that. Rather, it was like fear and dread, and none of May, not of May herself, but of something they couldn't see. Everyone's desperate now, May said. Desperate? Sakuragi and her mother died in, in those accidents in May, so they, they couldn't say they, they only half believed it anymore. And then once June started, there were two more. It's begun, for sure, which didn't explain much. So then, I mean, why is that? I asked, each word a gasp from her oxygen in my depleted lungs. How is any of that related to anything else? Why would that make everyone gain up on someone and act like they're not there? It's so pointless. Why? You really think that, don't you? I do. The short sleeves of my summer uniform exposed my arms, which had been covered in goosebumps for some kind for some time now, and it wasn't going away. And not just because the air conditioning was too cold. Do you remember the story about the Isaki from 26 years ago? May asked at length, covering the eye patch on her left eye with the palm of her right hand, after her left hand, as if to hide it. Twenty-six years ago. So this did have something to do with that. Of course, I replied, leaning forward on the sofa. Her hand still resting over her eye patch, May's voice quiet as she told the story. Misaki, the popular kid from class third year class three, died of everyone died, and everyone kept pretending that Misaki's still alive anyway, and then on graduation day, the image of Misaki, who couldn't possibly have been there, showed up in the class photo. I think that's as far as we got. Yeah. You still don't know the rest? No one will, will tell me. No one will tell me. Then I will tell you now, May said, moistening her lips with a flick of her pink tongue. What happened 26 years ago was a trigger. And ever since, third year class three of North Yomi has been drawn nearer to death. Nearer to death? Actually, on my first day of school, May had said something similar when I had talked to her on the roof of a building C. I still remember it vividly. Third year class three is the closest to death, more than any other class at the school. Much more. What do you mean? What does that mean? I inclined my head, rubbing my arms briskly. The first time something happened 25 years ago, Misaki's classmate had its fall graduated. It was the third year class day that came after them. The same thing started to happen after that. Though it doesn't happen every year, maybe about once every two years. And that is, I'm going to tell it the way I had seen it. But don't get the wrong idea. I've heard all, all of this from other people. This has been passed on through lots of people over lots of years. So basically some kind of legend. The situation made it impossible to write the whole thing off as just that. I nodded solemnly, my eyes fixed on May's lips. The students have their own channels for handling the story down for handing the story down among themselves, separate from the teachers. Last year's third year class three tells the next year's third year class three. That's how I found out about most of this. This stuff goes around and in the other classes in the other years, kind of like a rumor. But at its root, this is a secret that only people involved in third year class three know, and they absolutely cannot talk about it to anyone else. So, come on, what is it? I couldn't stop chafing my arms. The goosebumps just wouldn't go away. A mysterious event that first happened to third year class three 25 years ago, May said, flinging the words out. Then she broke off in my sight, and my breath caught. When that happened, when it started, I mean, there was at least one death every month, without exception, in third year class three that year. Sometimes it was the students, sometimes it was their families. There were accidents and illnesses, sometimes a suicide, or they would be involved in some kind of accident. There were people who said it had to be a curse. A curse? The curse of third year class three, huh? What is it? I asked again. What is this mysterious event? Well, May finally dropped her hand from her eye patch and replied. 
there's one extra kid in the class. No one notices when they get added. There's an extra person, and no one has any way of telling who it is. There's one extra person? I repeated it back to her, not understanding. Someone had to have... I told you, we don't know who it is, May answered, her expression moving, unmoving. It first happened 25 years ago, April 1973. As soon as the new semester started, they realized they were one desk short in the classroom. They thought they had gotten enough desks already for the number of students in class that year, and when they tried to start class, they realized they were one short. And that was because the number of students had gone up. Yeah. But you can't tell who the extra kid is. You can ask everyone, but no one will say it's them, and no one knows, either. Even so, unable to grasp this idea, I cut in with the most obvious of questions. Can't they look like something like that up, up on the class list or in school records? It doesn't work. No matter where they look, the class list has all kinds of records. Everything seems to match up. More like, they can't tell that the records don't match up. Because things are channel are changed, like tampered with, so they can't prove anything. So they're just short one desk. Hmm, excuse me. Tampered? So someone secretly doctors the records? Tampered is just a metaphor. See, it's not just the records. Everyone's memories get altered too. Huh? You don't think that's possible, do you? Well, no. But apparently it's true. As she responded, May looked extremely confused about how to explain it. It isn't anything a person could have done. That's the kind of phenomenon it was. It is. At least, that's how someone explained it to me. A phenomenon? Ugh. I could barely understand what she was telling me. Tampering with the records? Altering people's memories? That kind of thing was totally... When someone dies, there's a funeral. I don't know why, but out of nowhere, my grandfather's papery voice played in my ears, with that same strange low-frequency sound, as if obscuring his words. I don't... I don't want to go to any more funerals. At first, they all thought someone had screwed up, so they dug up an extra desk and chair and forgot about it. I suppose that's natural. It's not something that would normally occur to anyone. The number of students going up by one without anyone noticing. No one took the... Pr possibility serious. But then, her right eye, not hidden by the eye patch, slowly closed and then opened again. Like I said, starting that April, people linked into the class started to die each month. This is an indisputable fact. Every month for a whole year. For 1973, I think it was six students and ten families remembers. It's not exactly normal. No, I couldn't disagree with that. If it really did happen, 16 people in one year, I knew that number was definitely out of the ordinary. May slowly closed and then opened her eye again, and then went on. And then the same thing happened in the year after that, at two. When the new semester started, there were one desk short and every month someone died. And then, and by then, the people in the middle of it knew that they knew it couldn't be anything ordinary. Some people even said it had to be a curse curse of third year class three. If it is a curse, then where did it come from? Then where did it come from? I asked, and May replied called me as follows. It was the curse of Misaki who died 26 years ago. Why would Misaki put a curse on, every on anyone? I pressed. It's not like Misaki had any horrible experiences in class or anything, right? Everyone was sad about the sudden death and such a popular kid, weren't they? And Misaki curse him anyway? It is strange, isn't it? I think so, too. That's why someone told me that this is different from what you'd call a curse. Who's someone? It was starting to bug me, so I thought I'd ask. May didn't answer, and instead, Ed started to prep us ahead with the story. So then... Wait, I stopped her, and pressed a thumb against my left temple. Let me organize this a little. Twenty-six years ago, Misaki from third year class three died. The next year, there was an extra person in the class, but no one knows who it was. Then every month, the kids in the class, as were their family members, started to die. I mean, what exactly is the logic tying this stuff together? Why do people die? And when there's someone extra, why would... 
I don't know any formal logic for that. May gave a slight shake of her head. I'm not really a specialist in the issue. It's just that after all the stuff that's happened up until now, I don't know. I got a picture that's come um, together from experience. Everyone involved knows the story since it gets handed down every year. She lowered her voice by saying, The someone extra is the casualty. What? The tip of my thumb pressed even harder to my temple. Um, is that... You mean me, Saki, who died, who died 26 years ago? No, it doesn't work like that. May gave another small shake of her head. It's not me, Saki. It's some other casualty. Casualty? Oh, causality. Wow, I've been misreading that the entire time. The word scratched in May's desk. Wait. Causality, yeah. The word scratched in the May's desk in the classroom. Who is the causality? The words flashed dubiously through my mind. It was everyone in the third year class three 26 years ago, all acting that way, that started all this. They decided that their dead classmate, Misaki, wasn't dead anyway, and was actually still alive right over there, and kept the act going the whole year. The result was that when they took the photo in her classroom of the classroom the day of graduation, it showed Misaki, who couldn't have been present in the living world. If you think about it, the causality had been called all back to them. May went on. Her expression was as static as ever. Meaning, maybe that the trigger, or, and that's why the third year class three of North Yomi is closer to death. Maybe it became in a sight, like a vessel draws the causality in. It's something like that. It draws the causality in? Yeah, obviously there's no rational explanation for it, but still, that's what started to happen. That's how the story goes. Just like the other time she told me this, surrounded by the dolls in the basement, May at some point shifted it had some point shifted to a tone that suggested the secrets of the world lay exposed before her. The causality is part of the class because the entire class is closer to death. I suppose you could look at it at the other way too. Since the causality got mixed up in the class, we got closer we came closer to death. Whichever way it is, are you listening, Sakakibara? Death is emptiness, just like the dolls. If you get too close to it, it sucks you in. That's why that's why someone dies every month. Try thinking about it like this, May said. I came up with this on my own though. The closer we get to death, the easier it is for people to die compared to a sight. Compared to a sight. That's not like that. What does that mean? For example, even if you go about your daily life the same way, you're more likely to have an accident. Even in the same accident, you're more likely to get badly hurt. Even with the same injury, you're more likely to die from them like that. Ugh. So stuff popped up in all different facets of life, like a risk bias. And kept building up, until at some point yanked you once and for all into death? Was she asking me to interpret it like that? So was that why Yukari Sakuragi had met such a, such a string of misfortune? unfortunate accidents and lost her life? Why Miss, Miss Noah died in an elevator accident? But that doesn't that doesn't make sense, I thought. How could anyone believe that? It was utterly unacceptable in, in the thought process based on common sense. It couldn't possibly. Hey, Sakakibara. Do you believe in ghosts or curses or whatever? Is that your thing? In the midst of my intense confusion, several scenes came back to me so-called paranormal phenomena in general? That was the unprovoked grilling I received from Teshiguara and Kazumi on lunch my first day of school. They had been feeling me out. Had they been feeling me out with those questions in order to lay the groundwork for revealing this issue to the transfer student? And yet they had never gone into any profound details. Of course. That was because I spied May right then, sitting on a bench across from a flower bed in front of Building Zero, I ignored their alarm reactions and handed over to her. Was that why... Um, do you mind if I ask you a couple things I don't really get? I asked, moving my finger from my temple. Go ahead, May replied, stroking the eye patch over her left eye. But I'm not an expert. That's a lot... There's a lot I don't understand either. Okay. 
I nodded and straightened my back. Um, first of all, you said that the one extra person is the causality, right? Does that mean they're like a ghost? Well, May's head tilted to one side. It's probably not like the usual image of a ghost that's out there. It's not just an ethereal presence. It has a physical body, they say. A physical body? It's kind of a strange thing to say, but the causality is no different from a living person. It has its own flesh body. So like a zombie, then? Well, May's head tilted to one side again as she looked back into her, in my face. I think it's different. They don't hunt people down or eat them or anything. Probably not, huh? Then when people die every month, it isn't as if the causality reached out with its own hands to kill them. The causality has feelings, and it has enough memories to integrate into the situation. It has no idea at all that, all that it's the causality. That's why you can't tell who they are. So then, my question grew together, slowly. At some point or other, it becomes clear who the extra person mixed into the class that year was, right? That, yeah. They say you can find out, and you find out once graduation is over. How do you find out? Because the extra person disappears. They say the records and memories of the person go back to the way they were too. What kind of person gets mixed up in the class is the causality exactly? Has there ever been someone without a link or any association to the class? I don't know, but there is a kind of rule for it. A rule? It's a person who's died as part of his phenomenon before. Whether it's an actual student from third year class three, or their little brother or sister, or... Then who could have it have been the first time, 25 years ago? Was it Misaki, since they died the year before? But then wouldn't when someone have... Someone would have realized Misaki's here, wouldn't they? And maybe that, and maybe that thought was, the, was proof that I, I couldn't let go of rational thinking. A lot... A lot of the changes in tampering happens all on their own, so I don't think it, it would have seemed strange if it were me, Saki, May responded. But I heard that's not what's happening this year. Then who is it? Misaki's little brother or sister. They died at the same time Misaki did, and they were one year younger than Misaki. So they it would have have been a year they would have been a third year that year. Misaki's little brother or sister. I see. I spoke the words myself then, and couldn't help acknowledging it. You're saying that for a whole year, no one, not even the teachers, not even the students, noticed that this kid, who had died the year before, was in the class, and they just accepted it as reality? That's what I'm saying. May nodded, and then let out a long sigh and shut her eyes. The very picture of exhaustion. Two seconds, then three, went by before she murmured. Ah, oh, but... She opened her right eye in a slit. No matter how much I try to explain it, it's a hard story to pin down on when you start thinking about it. How come? Well, May mulled over her words, but when, when she spoke, they came with hardly any hesitation at all. After a year where that happens, obviously the fact remains that a lot of people died, but they say that people's memories about the event itself fade, especially about who was the extra person in the class. There's some difference between people, and some people forget right away. But in most cases, the memory becomes hazier over time until eventually, they forget. I heard this example from someone. Suppose a levee breaks, and water from the river floods into t the town. It's like the water is finally receding. The fact that there was a flood remains, unquestioningly. If, but after that water recedes... The memory of what got flooded and how badly starts to get fuzzy. It's like that. It's more that they, they can't help forgetting. Not that they're forced to forget, I guess. 25 years ago is like a fairy tale since it's before we were born. But in a global sense, it wasn't that long ago. But when the memories is of the people involved fade like that, it's like you said before, Sakakibara. It's become a total legend now. At that, a corner of May's mouth softened but her expression froze again right away. Until the end of my second year, I only caught snatches of rumors. After they had decided the class for third years, they called a meeting right away, and a couple of the kids from class three the year before who had, were graduating were there too. 
there's kind of a torch passing around about this issue. That was the first time I heard the reality of the legend. Her tone on of smothered emotions never faltered, but for her, it sounded as if there was all sorts of chaos in her heart. They explained it to us, and I realized that, that this wasn't a lie or a joke, that maybe we had to take this seriously. Even so, deep down, I only half believed it. As for everyone else, there were some um, kids who believed it completely, and some who didn't really buy it. A light-hearted tune cut through the room, playing in, in the oval clock that hung over the TV to tell the time. Six o'clock. It was that late already? I wouldn't be surprised to start getting worried phone calls from my grandmother asking, Where, where are you? Are you alright? What an awful machine. I remember May's comment. Would I never have been. No matter where you are, you're connected. They can catch you. I turned off the cell phone, still in the pocket of my pants. That's the rough outline of what we talked about, May said, that rested her its light chin in both hands. You want to hear the rest? Yeah, that'd be... How oh, could I not want to? Come on. Will you tell me? I asked, straightening my back again. Ever since 25 years ago, this abnormal phenomenon has kept happening, although not necessarily every year, as you might expect. People have tried to come up with something in the counter and counteract it. May began and to tell me the rest. Her tone was as, as detached as ever, and still suggested that she needed to grow up for words. But something as insane as this, so completely incompatible with real-world logic, Maybe you could call it supernatural. This kind of story could never be discussed by an official school administration. That's for sure. So at the first step, at least, discussions at a local level, at the level of those directly involved in the curse of third year class three, have, have been at the core of all kinds of strategies that people have considered. Like an exorcism? It was the simple old strategy that had occurred to me so far. They may have tried that. May replied without the slightest smiles. Changing classrooms, for example. They tried switching from the room they'd used was in the old building, Building Zero, for third year class three, every year up until then, thinking maybe the curse was tied to that spot, to the classroom. Uh huh. But it didn't do any good. They built the new school building and moved the third year classrooms to Building Zero to Building C, from Building Zero to Building C, 13 years ago. Apparently, they were hoping that they, uh, that would be the end of it, but of course, it didn't end. So you're saying it wasn't the classroom or the school building, it was purely the third year class three group that was the problem. That's what I'm saying. She replied such as she had earlier, and let out another long sigh and shut her eyes. For just a moment, I thought of the cold, I thought the cold of the overly air-conditioned room would turn her, hel turn her breath white. Without realizing it, I began rubbing my arms again. And this is where I suppose we finally get to the heart of things, May said, gently opening her right eyes. They say it happened ten years ago. It's not really clear if someone got the idea and spoke up about it or what, but they found a strategy that was effective against these events. If you could do this, you'd be able to avoid disaster, a strategy that makes it so people don't start dying every month. Oh? It was that at that point that a vague image came into my mind of what sort of strategy May was talking about. That's why. That. Meaning. We treat someone like they're not there in place of the extra person. The words that came from May's lips were exactly what I imagined. That way, you bring the class back to the number of people it's supposed to have. You balance the books. That's how you prevent disaster for that year. With that talisman. All right, I think that is a brilliant place to drop off, especially considering there is a very long interlude. All right, so let me bookmark that, and then I'll get us over to our chat stream. That way, we can just relax a little and wind down before we send us off for the night. All right, so how did everybody like that stream? Was that a lot of fun? I hope everybody liked it, because it was a lot of fun. I loved it. 
and I really appreciate how active the stream was this time, and thank you so much, um, call me Sen Imperial Daddy, um, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, thank you so much again for letting me know that I was speaking a little too quietly, I was able to correct that, thank you so much, and I should be able to improve that during these next few reading streams. And yeah, with that being said, that is the end of our stream. Thank you guys so much for coming. And we will be having another reading stream this coming Sunday. And I might even post the schedule a little bit earlier. Maybe if I get my schedule from the Academy this week, I tomorrow I'll be able to sort it out. That way we can get a set schedule set for next week, like as soon as possible. So that's the goal. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you again for everyone who joined. I'm so happy the stream ended as well as it did. And I'm very happy that the quality of the streams has really improved from where we started. So it just really makes me very happy. So let me see. Um, we're a pretty good chunk into the book. So this is actually a good time for us to start considering our next book which I actually may not do the voting this time because it is a book I really do want to get into for um, for spooky season. And I feel like it's a really good book to read during October in particular. It's called, let's see, what is it again? The Final Girls Support Group. It's basically a novel, let me see, what is that? I have it right here in my little pile of books right next to my desk. Hold on. There's like 20 different books here. <laughs> Um, let's see, The Final Girl Support Group, and it's by Grady Hendrix. I'm really interested in reading this because it's by an author that I've been seeing, like, glance around on book talk, and evidently they're the same author behind the book, The Southern or Books or Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which I have definitely seen flow, flowing around on book talk. So, and The Final Girl Support Group especially caught my eye because I'm a sucker for those, like, very cheesy, corny, like, 80s horror movies with the final girl and such. And it just really caught my eye, especially the concept. So, I'm thinking that would be a really good book to read um, during, uh, read for October, especially considering that's, like, directly on Halloween. And if we finish it early, then we'll just wrap it up, uh, wrap up the spooky season with another spooky book. And it doesn't matter if it carries over into November, just as long as it's done by the time of December. That way we can go into, like, maybe a Christmas scene story. There's actually a novel version of The Nightmare... Ooh, excuse me. Wow. There's a novel version of The Night Before Christmas now at my local Barnes & Noble. So maybe I'll read that, or maybe I'll read um, the sequel to A Nightmare Before Christmas that was actually released, I think, last year called Long Live the Pumpkin Queen. I would definitely, I'm definitely going to save that one for, um, for December. I did think about including it in our voting for October's book, uh, for, uh, September's book, but, um, I decided, I opted to instead include it in December's just because, you know, it just makes more sense. I don't know. I've always been, like, very on the fence about The Nightmare Before Christmas, like, as either a Christmas or a Halloween movie, because, like, yeah, it's a it's a very, like, flip-floppy movie. Like, you can play it during Halloween, you can play it during Christmas, but I don't know why. I just feel like it's a great movie to play when segueing into Christmas. I don't know. That's just a, that's just a weird thing about me. I still do love Nightmare Before, Before Christmas in any capacity, regardless of if it's during Halloween or Christmas, but I, I don't know why. It just feels right, especially to play it after, after Halloween, especially considering the movie does take place right after Halloween. 364. Anyways. <laughs> All right. With that being said, thank you guys so much for joining tonight's stream. And then this Sunday, we will wrap up the week. We will start the week off with a new story uh, with another. We're doing another big chunk of another. I think we'll be able to get pretty far in. And then I will see you guys that stream. Thank you guys so much for joining again, and I will see you guys again soon. Thank you for coming. Good night.